Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Ron Vale, and I'm the executive director of Genelia Research Campus of the Howard Hughes Medical Institute. And I'd like to welcome you to day two of the workshop on the composition, communication, and function of the tumor microenvironment, which I'm co-organizing with Michaela Egeblad, Harold Varmus, and Janine Stevens. This workshop is one of 10 that Janili is holding over the next few months to explore the interface between cell biology and physiology. Janili is launching a new research area called 4D Cellular Physiology, and we will be recruiting 15 group leaders over the next few years. And this effort will begin this fall. The workshops are being held to guide us in thinking through outstanding questions that need to be addressed in understanding how cells function and communicate in their native tissue environments, and also what new technologies or theories will be needed to approach these problems. For those uh, that may be just joining us today, I wanna mention that the style of the workshop is a bit different in a, from ones you may have attended previously. In addition to highlighting their own work, we're asking our speakers to present forward-looking ideas on important open questions, dream experiments, and new technologies that are needed to overcome current barriers. As a reminder, there will be a five minute Q&A after each talk, and the audience can type in their question in the Q&A box, and you can do so while the talk is being delivered. And panelists, you can ask a question in the chat box. And after each session, we will conclude with an open discussion and that will be led by the session moderator and will involve the speakers as well as all of the invited workshop participants. So now I'd like to introduce and hand things over to my friend, Harold Varmus. Uh, and Harold will add some additional thoughts and then begin the workshop. Harold. Thank you, Ron. So uh, welcome to everybody. Um, I uh, am here not because of my expertise in the, in the tumor microenvironment, uh, but as a member of the Scientific Advisory Board, this happy, happy to be working with Ron as he develops new programs at Janelia Farm. Um, my own history in cancer research is much more reductionistic, uh, focused more, in, more on the, the, uh, the genotype of cancer cell and less on the microenvironment. But I think as we've all learned over the last 20 or 30 years, the new technologies, especially in uh, single cell biology, genomics, imaging, information um, management uh, and uh, many other things have allowed us to begin to probe the, the cells and large molecules that surround cancer cells and often dictate their biological behavior. Today we're going to talk um, about three major topics. Metabolism, which has been touched on yesterday briefly. Uh, imaging, which seems to be relevant to everything relevant to the microenvironment. And, uh, and heterogeneity, which is implicit in, in the no nature of a, of a complex biological system that surrounds cancer cells and permeates our conversations. Um, yesterday, there were many high points of uh, discovery and, uh, and technology. Um, I have been urging in our private sessions that we try to maintain focus on the big biological questions that a uh, an industrial, industrious probe of the microenvironment are likely to reveal. There's an opportunity here to intersect with other efforts to understand uh, the composition of tumors uh, ranging from the cancer, uh, the, the, the uh, uh, cancer uh, genome atlas project, the human cell atlas, and many other atlases that are being assembled uh, as we speak. Um, and uh, implicit in all of that is the recognition that uh, that not all cells that look alike are necessarily doing the same things, uh, that uh, the new information coming out about uh, the uh, ways in which we can identify uh, the, the form and function of cells that, that uh, are playing a role in the microenvironment and that uh, our ability to identify those cells with markers and, uh, and, high, uh, and, and uh, uh, highly um, detailed imaging methods uh, are incredibly important. I want to alert uh, members of the final private session uh, that you've received an email from Ron this morning, which you should look at, study, and respect, um, and uh, will be informative, uh, it'll help inform the discussion we have uh, at 3.40 this afternoon. Um, without further ado, I want to introduce uh, uh, Eileen White, 
uh, who is a member of royalty in the world of autophagy, who will be running the first session on metabolism. Um, and um, we'll be hearing from several speakers uh, during that session. So um, Eileen, take it away. Nice to have you here. Oh, thank, thank you. Um, it's my pleasure to moderate the metabolism session. Um, as you all know, metabolism, well, cancer is a metabolic disease. And I think what we've learned in recent years is that, uh, that there's a lot of nutrient sharing between tumors, tumor cells and the microenvironment, uh, but also com metabolic communication between the tumor and the host. Uh, and I hope that we'll touch on these issues and the latest technologies in measuring metabolism uh, in, um, in the tumor microenvironment. And to start us off, uh, first we have Donita Brady uh, from the University of Pennsylvania. Donita? There you go. Uh, thank you very much, Eileen, uh, for the kind introduction and to everyone for having me here today to participate in this workshop on the composition, communication, and function of the tumor microenvironment. Uh, my lab at, here at the University of Pennsylvania really focuses on the connection between nutrients within, uh, within tumors signal transduction pathways and how we can leverage the connection between those me uh, metabolites and, and signaling pathways. And so um, we've heard uh, a lot throughout this meeting on the composition of the tumor and the, uh, the stromal and immune cells that make up the tumor microenvironment. And many of the fundamental basic science discoveries in genetics have really transformed our knowledge of the origins of cancer and ushered in a new area of hope for personalized approaches to cancer therapy. And while tumor evolution and the majority of cancer types involves the succession of genetic perturbations, um, the multi-step process uh, essential for tumor cell fitness is really molecularly driven by these aberrant signaling events that my lab studies. And those signaling events um, endow unique cellular characteristics and functional capabilities term the hallmarks of cancer. Um, but not only are these genetic perturbations that lead to molecular features that are required for these uh, cellular characteristics important to understand cancer biology, but there is the requirement for metabolic rewiring of tumor cells because this is essential for the initiation, proliferation, and progression of, of cancer. And so you can really think about tumor cell metabolism itself being important for many of these hallmarks of cancer, where we know that tumors remodel metabolite uh, con con consumption, thereby generating molecular products such as cofactors and building blocks. Tumor cells must adapt their metabolism to meet the increased demands for energy and biomass for precursors and cofactors. And it's generally thought that in tumors, this en um, enhanced aerobic glycolysis, also known as the Warbuck effect, is an important um, uh, mediator of this metabolic adaptation that's important for sustaining cancer progression. And indeed, most tumors characterized by, um, are characterized by this massive increase in glucose consumption and lactate uh, secretion. Um, as exemplified by what I'll show you later, the wide use of positron emission tomography for imaging tumor, tumor metabolism. Um, outside of that, this uh, aerobic glycolysis enables cancer cells, even in the presence of oxygen, to convert large amounts of glucose um, derived pyruvate to lactate through the activity of lactate de dehydrogenase. But when we think about how these tumor cells interact with the microenvironment, micro uh, the cells that make up the microenvironment, we begin to see a more complex uh, picture. And the metabolite composition of the tumor microenvironment is determined by different levels of regulation. 
Um, one of the first that you can think about is the no local nutrient availability. And this is defined primarily by tumor cell metabolism and there through the metabolic crosstalk of tumor cells and the infiltrating immune cells and supporting uh, stromal cells. So all of these cells that are making up that tumor are competing for uh, nutrients. And those the, the waste that is produced by the tumor cells is often then utilized um, by the, the stromal cells. Um, nevertheless, the metabolic microenvironment is also determined by the anatomical location of the tumor. So what I've shown here on the left side of my screen is different um, uh, organs in which tumors can arise. And dependent upon the organ, organ type, the metabolic uh, features of that organ are going to determine which uh, metabolites are actually required for sustaining proliferation. And this metabolic heterogeneity has been found in different organs and even subclonal, uh, sublocal origins in tumor locations, owing to that tissue structure and levels of uh, perfusion and function. And then finally, differences in metabolite availability can also arise from changes in systemic metabolism, such as those due to dietary interventions and the function of metabolic organs or metabolic syndromes. And it's really important for us to consider how this, there is the, me, the metabolite composition of the tumor microenvironment is shaped by the stromal cells and immune cells themselves, and how each of these these cell types actually has a unique metabolic uh, profile, dependency and vulnerability that could be important for treating, uh, treating cancer, which is something that our lab tries to focus on. So what has the field really done um, to date in terms of methodologies to detect uh, metabolic features of tumors. Um, as I mentioned earlier, um, one of the most widely utilized um, clinical uh, um, features of metabolism in, in tumors is the use of positron emission tomography, where you're using um, FDG PET um, to look at, to, to leverage this increase in glucose uh, metabolism that's happening in many tumors. And so what I'm showing here is a, is a patient with BRAF mutant uh, melanoma. Um, and this patient was given the marathinib, and you can start to see that this FDG PET starts to decrease based on the based on the fact that um, the tumor is is highly uh, glycolytic. Um, one of the other methodologies that um, is being utilized to understand the metabolic features of tumors is dynamic nuclear polarization, um, enhanced uh, uh, C13 nuclear magnetic resonance uh, spectroscopy imaging. Here you use a hyperpolarized uh, substrate. So for example, in these images, this is a rat with a li uh, liver tumor. Um, the rat is given uh, hyperpolarized C13 pyruvate. And on the left, this is a pretreatment tumor. So you can start to observe the conversion of the C13 um, pyruvate into lactate. And so that's the um, imaging feature that we're reading out. And then the animal is given embolization, which prevents nucleant uh, nutrient supply to the tumor, which is a typical treatment for hepatocellular carcinoma. And you can see that the, um, the C13, the conversion of that hyperpolarized C13 pyruvate to lactate is, is reduced. And then finally, one of the, the, the um, technologies that is really starting to, to, to hit, the, hit the market and I think will be important to give us increased spatial resolution in the context of metabolism within the tumor and the tumor microenvironment is um, MALDI imaging mass spectrometry. And this is where you take a conventional tissue section, it's coded with a matrix, um, and you're able to extract the metabolites um, by uh, utilizing a UV laser. Um, and then this allows you to um, do subsequent MALDI measurements. And this allows you to get um, the information for metabolism that's happening in this tissue. Um, and so here, what we're looking at is um, a, a mouse tumor in which the, there um, was provided <clears throat> um, C13 uh, glucose, and you're looking at um, uh, the lactate signature here. And so what you can begin to appreciate is that the spatial resolution for these technologies hasn't necessarily um, 
moved forward. And, and one of the things that we're interested in doing in my lab is thinking about um, how do we image uh, metabolism in real time. And so my lab is really interested in the activity of protein kinases and how they can be a readout for metabolic uh, features of, of tumors. And because nutrients and specifically metabolites or the metals that are there typically activate um, uh, proteins within that tumor microenvironment, you can think about this as a readout for metabolite um, availability. And so, for instance, my lab is interested in micronutrients like metals, um, specifically copper, and how it activates protein kinase signaling in tumors. And so, um, very similar to the imaging approaches that I showed you previously, what we're really interested in is utilizing, um, uh, utilizing protein function as a readout for metabolite availability in the tumor. And so you can think about this very similarly to what has been done for a very, very long time in terms of precision medicine, where we've utilized genetic profiling of cancer patients in order to stratify them for uh, treatment options. Instead, in this case, we would like to bring forward chemical biology technologies that allow us to um, understand metabolite uh, protein interactions to read out um, uh, for functionality. So what would this look like? Um, as, as we all know, oncogenic signaling is required for many of the hallmarks of cancer. And we've started to develop a large toolkit of nucleophilic chemical biology probes. Many of you have probably heard about uh, traditional chemical biology probes for activity-based protein profiling. And these are largely um, adaptable electrophilic uh, Philic tools that selectively and covalently react with nucleophilic sites. Uh, in contrast, we're utilizing this reverse polarity activity-based proteomics approach where we utilize the nucleophilic probes that attach to um, protein electrophiles. So instead, post-translational modifications, which are actually either cofactors or um, or post-translational modifications like uh, acetylation, for example, which is reading out the availability of acetyl-CoA. And so by utilizing these probes, we can add them to tumor tissue and either do uh, profiling by mass spec or um, in gel-based assays or imaging. And so what does this look like in practice? For example, we know that one of our probes interacts with the um, uh, protein uh, FTO. And so as we increase the concentration of the chemotherapeutic compound cisplatin, we see reduced reactivity of our probe with, um, with FTO, suggesting that this is a competable um, dependent or metal dependent interaction with this enzyme that's required for, required for cellular metabolism. We've also been able to leverage these probes and imaging technologies. What's nice about this is that these are for, formalin fixed and paraffin embedded samples where we see differences in probe reactivity uh, in either the lung or in breast breast cancer tissue, where um, this P11 probe, we start to see nuclear puncta. And this is very different than what we see in normal breast uh, tissue, suggesting that there is a chemical feature of, uh, of these breast cancer um, cells that we can read out via imaging, and it doesn't require uh, um, flash, flash frozen uh, tissues. And then finally, to think about metabolic perturbations or or even treatment perturbations and how we can measure differences in this utilizing chemical probes. What we've done so far is in hepatocellular carcinoma, we've treated cells um, by putting them under low oxygen and then treated them with the P17 thymosine probe. And what we find is that we see very different proteomic labeling um, in these cells uh, when we've either treated with hypoxia or these um, chemotherapeutic uh, compounds. And so what we believe this is reading out is the actual functionality within, within these tumor cells, which can be related back to the tumor metabolism um, within those tissues. And so we're really excited to potentially think about ways that we can bring this technology to bear to unravel the complexity of tumor metabolism in the microenvironment. And with that, um, I'd be happy to take any, any questions. Thank you, thank you, Danita. Thank you, Danita.
Um, maybe I could start off the questions. Can you uh, speak a little bit about the specificity of the probes? Yeah, that's a really great question. Um, what's, what's nice about the probes, at least so far, is that we have at least 20 that can hit multiple different protein classes of, of enzymes. Most of these are dependent upon the installation of a post-translational modification, like a, um, a unique glyoxyl um, modification or a pyruval modification. These are unique post-translational modifications. Um, or they interact with en enzymatic cofactors like copper or iron, um, uh, or some of these iron deoxyglutarate enzymes or FAD requiring uh, enzymes. And so um, what we know so far is that we get unique profiles based on the probes that we use. And so I think that that will allow us to um, understand that the, the differences in protein activity that are dependent upon many of, this many of these metabolites. Um, but we're starting to, to work that out now and we'll be able to functionalize these probes in the future to make them more selective and even make them um, drugs. Okay, we have a question here from Prabhs uh, Sengupta, who wants to know how do depletion of nutrients, hypoxia, waste accumulation arising from cancer cell metabolism affect immune cell signaling in the tumor? And is there a switch in immune cell metabolism as well? Um, that's a great question. While my lab doesn't focus on that, um, what we do know, at, at, least, at least to date, is quite um, typically the waste that is given off by tumor cells can um, reduce uh, immune activity. So what's been shown um, previ previously is that that increase in lactate or acidic environment can reduce T cell function. Um, and so that is part of the reason why um, the tumor cell metabolism is critically important for um, a, a tumor uh, evasion of the immune system. And a related question is mod modulating T cell metabolism a viable intervention strategy in cancer? I think there are many, many labs that are going after that uh, as a way to, to, to think about um, uh, to think about treating treating cancer. So I think if you were able to help T cells sustain that increase in uh, acidic um, microenvironment, then that would be one way to um, accelerate their function in, in the tumor microenvironment. There are other um, there are other immune cell com uh, um, components that are also critically dependent upon uh, tumor cell function. So for example, e um, many labs, including uh, Eileen's have even shown that if you affect autophagy in the tumor, um, that that alters uh, macrophage infiltration. And that's important for the anti-tumor uh, effects. I think we have time for one more question. Uh, this is from Nazani Rohani, who wants to know, have you seen correlations between these probes, activities, and hypoxia or acidosis markers spatially within tumor sections? That's a, that's a great question, but okay. um, we haven't done that yet. Um, yeah. I, I think that's, what we want. That's, that's really what we want to do in the future, is now that we can observe differences by utilizing these chemical probes spatially, um, we want to now manipulate the system um, by altering nutrient availability, for example, to see how that's going to um, uh, affect, um, uh, affect probe labeling. And can that then be utilized as a readout for um, uh, treatments that may be altering uh, nutrient availability? Okay, thank you uh, for that great presentation, uh, Donita. And now uh, we're going to move on to uh, Daniela Quayle from McGill University. Are you ready? Yeah, I'm okay. just sharing my screen. Great. All right, um, I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me to speak today. This has been a really exciting meeting so far. Um, my lab studies the effects of obesity and metabolic syndrome on the tumor immune microenvironment, and we're very interested in tools that allow us to study the complexity of cancer. 
So these images show 40 color mass cytometry images of a single tumor within the same patient. And you don't need to be an expert to see that all of these images look very different. There are diverse cellular players within different areas of the tumor landscape. The problem is that a lot of studies um, on cancer research are focused specifically on genes or pathways within tumor cells individually. And in the past decade, we've seen a surge of research focused on tumor stroma interactions, but what about everything else that's going on around these specific interactions? And how does the complexity of the microenvironment change when tumors are situated in different types of tissues and exposed to different systemic factors? Or how does the tumor microenvironment change in different body types, especially when there are dramatic systemic differences between different body types? And as a consequence, the physiology of our tissues can be highly diverse. For example, it might be easy to see why fatty liver might affect liver cancer in a person who's obese, but how does it affect lung tumor? Or how does the systemic inflammatory response to fatty liver affect things like immune checkpoint inhibitor efficacy? Uh, now, the danger from obesity really stems from its association with metabolic syndrome, which increases the risk of very serious health conditions like heart disease, stroke, type 2 diabetes, and more recently, we're also starting to appreciate a connection with cancer. This is a table um, summarizing a review that I wrote with a collaborator, Andrew Dannenberg, on the obese adipose tissue microenvironment, where we discuss how obesity is associated with chronic low-grade inflammation, which is evident in the immune cell composition locally within white adipose tissue, but also systemically where we see a shift towards increased myelopoiesis and impaired lymphopoiesis and T-cell exhaustion. In obese individuals, we also see an accumulation of ectopic adipocytes, dysfunctional blood vessels, higher systemic markers of oxidative stress, and more severe reactions to infection, which is something that we've been seeing more recently with COVID-19 patients. And cancer obesity is associated with increased incidence of 13 different types of cancer, as well as an increased relative risk of death from 14 different types of cancer. And it's estimated that obesity now competes with smoking tobacco as the leading preventable risk factor for cancer mortality, estimated to be responsible for up to 20% of all cancer-related deaths in adults. So how is this all happening? As we gain weight, our adipocytes undergo hypertrophy and hyperplasia, and this causes the infiltration of activation of innate immune cells like macrophages and neutrophils within the local microenvironment. This in turn releases various factors into the systemic circulation like adipokines, cytokines, and other pro-inflammatory mediators like free fatty acids, which lead to the disruption of homeostasis in distant sites, which can include lymphoid organs and also common metastatic organs like liver and lung. And ultimately, these changes work together to influence the microenvironmental composition of tumors and can change the way that cancer behaves. So to give you a little flavor of an example of how this process affects cancer, during my postdoc with Joanna Joyce, we showed that obesity was associated with increased primary tumor growth and metastasis of breast cancer driven by systemic mediators of lung neutrophilia like IL-5 and GMCSF. And then more recently in my own lab, we have found that within lung tissue, neutrophils exhibit enhanced oxidative burst and release neutrophil extracellular traps and various proteases like MMP9, which work together to impair the integrity of the endothelium, thus creating a microenvironment that is more permissive to metastatic extravasation and colonization. We've also recently performed 40 color mass cytometry experiments on peripheral blood from lean and obese mice, which have shown that obesity causes dramatic changes to, to immune cell frequencies, including higher numbers of neutrophils um, consistent with our previous work. But what's interesting is although you see that the frequency is different in these cells, um, the phenotype is actually quite similar in the peripheral circulation. And it's only once you arrive at the tissue and the lung that you start to see dramatic phenotypic differences. And this ultimately all translates to major differences in the cellular landscape of lung metastases in lean and obese patients, which can be seen here with 36 color multiplex uh, imaging modalities. So this leads me to the first research challenge and that's that cancer biology seems to be fundamentally different between lean and obese contexts, yet this is not how we study cancer in the laboratory setting. In the clinic, obesity is measured using body mass index, which is weight in kilograms over your height in meters squared. We know that in North America, um, in the adult population, about 30% of people are obese and another 30% are overweight. Um, so this is really what BMI is telling us in terms of who is going to develop metabolic syndrome. 
The problem is that the biology is a lot more complicated than this. So about uh, one in five people who are lean are metabolically obese normal weight, which means they have similar health risks to obese individuals, even though they appear to be healthy. And also about a quarter of obese individuals are metabolically healthy. Um, and within the overweight population, about 30% have metabolic syndrome while the rest are metabolically healthy. So this is the real picture of metabolic syndrome on the left, yet on the right, this is what body mass index is telling us. And so if we could do a better job at identifying and pinpointing who is at risk, imagine what that could do for cancer prevention and early intervention. So that brings me to the second research challenge, and that's how do we accurately identify those who are metabolically obese and at higher risk of cancer incidence or death? So this all begs the question, is obesity always bad? Um, and it turns out that the answer is no. So in some types of cancer, elevated BMI is actually a positive prognostic factor. Uh, this is something that aligns with the obesity paradox and the two best studied cancer types that fall into this category are lung and renal cancer. And similarly, weight loss is not always a good thing. So for example, BMI is lowered by cachexia, but we know that cachexia is associated with worse cancer prognosis. And from a metabolic and an inflammatory standpoint, lowering BMI from cachexia is completely different than lowering BMI from exercise or a shift in nutrition. Similarly, the type and the timing of exercise matters. So this is a summary of a review that I wrote with a collaborator, Lean Jones at Sloan Kettering, where we discuss how repeated bouts of uh, physical activity has a different effect on the availability of nutrients within the systemic milieu compared to acute bouts of um, exercise. Recent work has also shown that obesity is associated with enhanced response to immune checkpoint inhibitors. And this is something we've been able to recapitulate in mice. But interestingly, we find that treatment response changes depending on the location of tumor cell transplantation, even if the tumor cell lines are identical. So this really emphasizes the importance of the tumor microenvironment in mediating immune checkpoint inhibitor efficacy uh, in conjunction with systemic variables. So this brings me to the third uh, challenge, and that's sometimes high BMI is a good thing and weight loss may not always be advantageous for patients, uh, but what we really need is evidence-based lifestyle recommendations for modifiable host factors in cancer patients, which can include things like obesity, diet, exercise, and, and likely also the microbiome, uh, but how to personalize these recommendations is a very difficult challenge in cancer research. So what are the key unanswered questions in the field that would help accelerate discoveries through basic research? First, we need better models of metabolic obesity. The most commonly and widely used tool is to use a 60% lard diet. And I don't know about anyone listening, but I don't eat a 60% lard diet. Yet this is the best tool that we have available. And this is the standard tool that everyone uses. So we really need uh, well-characterized mouse models that more accurately reflect human diet and consider relevant variables like age, sex, and genetics. And we need side-by-side -side comparisons of measurements of metabolic syndrome, as well as the microbiome. And we have some of this through the diversity outbred model that's available through JAX, but it's really not amenable to cancer research and the costs are very high. And so we need basic models to improve and replace the standard diet induced obesity model. We also need models that accurately capture metabolically obese normal weight biology and more reliable models of the obesity paradox so we can start to ask if there's real underlying biology at play in that um, context or whether this is just an artifact of epidemiological studies that rely on BMI and, and are therefore exposed to an, its inaccuracies. Second, how can we adopt a more holistic view of the effects of metabolic obesity on multiple organ systems? So in other words, how does the macro environment of the host affect cancer? So for example, how does fatty liver affect the immune microenvironment of breast cancer? To do this, we need better tools to measure nutrient competition between cells and between tissues and at the organismal level. This will allow us to ask questions like, does nutrient availability and obesity lower the barrier for oncogenic transformation? Um, how does the competition for nutrients affect T cell exhaustion and immune in, uh, inhibitor checkpoint inhibitor efficacy? Um, and is this different between a person who is lean or obese? And can we use diet to manipulate this process? And that's something that I think we're going to hear more about in the next talk from Matt Vanderheiden. Third, how does the immune system change with obesity? So first, we need better ex vivo models to study myeloid cells and capture their dynamic response to cancer and other systemic variables. Um, we can do this through organotypic cultures or microfluidic devices, which need to be made more accessible. 
We also need easier and more accessible tools for, for multiplex imaging. And although these tools exist, they're very expensive and they require a lot of time and effort to optimize. I think this all needs to become a lot simpler, a lot cheaper and move towards standard practice for histology. And then finally, how do we improve or replace body mass index in the clinical setting? You can imagine this being an application of wearable technology or simplified blood tests to get a more accurate picture of metabolic syndrome. And ultimately this is really important because it's going to reduce cancer disparities overall. So to conclude, I wanna emphasize my view that we're really limiting our progress by viewing cancer through the lens of a tumor cell. There are many different factors that influence the cellular makeup of a tumor at the level of tumor genetics, the tumor microenvironment, the systemic environment, as well as the environment of the host. And not only are these consider considerations important for understanding cancer biology, but they're also critical for understanding how efficacy of systemic therapies work, including immunotherapies. Um, so thank you, I'd like to take any questions. Thank you, that was great. Uh, we have a number of questions coming in. Uh, can you, uh, this is from Andreas Flavi, who wants to know, can you comment on the differences in cancer risk between diabetes type one and type two and LADA diabetes? Um, I'm, I'm not an expert in diabetes, but um, certainly um, diabetes is linked with obesity because of the link with metabolic syndrome. And there are dramatic um, differences in cancer risk and incidence in people who are obese, are obese versus people who are lean. Um, as I mentioned in my talk, there's 13 different types of cancer where that's been verified. Um, in many other different cancers, there may still be increased risk and increased in incidence, but um, studies have shown that the current evidence is insufficient to draw those conclusions in a conclusive way at this point. So here's a question from Joanna Joyce. Um, which suggestions would you have for an alternative to the high fat diet with 60% lard? Uh, any thoughts on the strains and backgrounds of mice used in terms of trying to recapitulate a very diverse human obese population? It's actually uh, hi, Joanna. That's a great question. Um, so one thing that we're trying to do in my lab now is compare uh, diet, the effects of diets on um, metabolic syndrome and the microbiome response to therapies, tumor growth. Um, across different diets that are commonly eaten by people, um, especially when you compare uh, different diets across different places in the world. Um, I, I don't know how that's gonna end up affecting um, each of these different factors and how that's gonna affect tumor growth ultimately. Um, so I think that really the starting point is just to start with a comparison of different diets that are commonly eaten by people and, and see how that impacts the biology and see if it reflects what's hap what happens at the epidemiological level. I also don't know that um, we're gonna be able to perfectly uh, model that using mouse models that don't have other systemic variables that people have like uh, you know, chronic inflammatory conditions in certain organs or, or being exposed to infection have a lot more inflammatory reactions to their environment. Um, where as we use mice in the lab that are, you know, more or less sterile. And so I don't know how accurate we're going to be able to get, but certainly we can do better than just 60% lard. So here's a question from Eric Sahai. Um, can you conceive of generating obese culture media uh, for in vitro fluidic models? Um, that's a really interesting question. I think that that would be uh, a really great tool for trying to create some more um, in vivo models that more accurately reflect what goes on in patients. The way that we've been doing that as kind of an easy solution recently is to use serum derived from mice that are on different diets or who are obese versus lean. Um, and so that's been uh, quite helpful so far in recapitulating some of the effects that we see in vivo, but whether we can uh, modulate more specifically the components of the media is something that um, we personally have not explored, but others have. Okay, Valerie Weaver asks, um, bariatric surgery rapidly normalizes metabolic syndrome in patients. What's your thought on the mechanism? 
So um, bariatric surgery is really interesting. There's a lot of um, really interesting data that shows there's also a decrease in the incidence and, and overall deaths from cancer with bariatric surgery. Um, I think part of this stems from the fact that it can normalize the adipose tissue microenvironment. And granted, I have a very immunology focused view of how obesity works. Um, but we see that, for example, uh, the development of crown-like structures and the activation of macrophages within adipose tissue is reduced with bariatric surgery. So that's at least one possible link with how it influences um, cancer outcomes because the uh, development and maintenance of these crown-like structures in adipose tissue is associated with cancer risk and progression. All right, I think we'll have to uh, stop it there for, uh, because of the time. Uh, so thank you very much. And now we're going to move on uh, to um, Matt Vanderheiden from MIT. Matt, are you ready? I'm ready. I, I hope so. Um, <laughs> sorry, I'm getting something here to unmute me. All right, great. Um, so first of all, I just want to thank the organizers, like everyone else, for the opportunity to present here. I'm personally really excited that Janelia is tackling this question of 4D cell physiology. And what I guess I'll do today at the request of um, the organizers is make a case for why metabolism should be part of this effort and outline at least what I see as some of the unique challenges and opportunities. So great. So my lab has been interested in understanding how metabolism supports physiology for a very long time. And if of course, we know a lot about how the biochemistry of metabolism works at the level of individual cells. We know how the food we eat is broken down and absorbed. And we know something about how levels of specific nutrients are sensed in individual cells or how they're maintained in, you know, at least for a few nutrients in the blood. However, there's a ton of questions that I would argue that we just don't understand at all. Um, a big one that we've been interested in is cells in our bodies are exposed to all kinds of different nutrients. How individual cells decide which nutrient to use and for what purpose is really not known. We don't have a good sense of how nutrients are shared between cells within tissues and across tissues, as we've heard highlighted by other speakers. When we get beyond things like glucose, we really don't know anything about how levels of specific nutrients are maintained in blood or tissues. And as Daniela alluded to, we really don't understand how diet is actually influencing many of these things. And most importantly, how this is different in different people and populations. And I would really argue that if we wanna understand 4D cellular physiology, that is how cells work together within tissues, this really underlies, at least the metabolism of how those cells work, really underlies a lot of this biology. And trying to figure that out actually would be um, tremendous for our field, but I think it would also really help us understand how, how organisms work. Now, a big question that my lab has been trying to answer is really how cell metabolism supports proliferation, that is how cells take up nutrients and use them to, to duplicate biomass. And we've been looking at this in the context of cancer, because as you've heard from our earlier speakers, cancer has many metabolic phenotypes at the organism, tissue, and cell level that clearly are altered or at least different from, from uh, many normal tissues. Now, I don't want to get into this, but I would argue that most of these are not as well understood, and that's because they really, why they occur is underlied really by this intercommunication physiology that's going on in the organism. And we can't understand them unless we could really better understand the physiology of what's going on. Now, many of you I know learned about metabolism a million years ago. I bet everyone on this call took an undergraduate biochemistry class. I teach this to undergrads at MIT, so I know well what you learn in that class. And I like to just quickly remind you what you learn because I think it's relevant for what's known and not known. What you learned about was largely how cells make ATP. You might have learned how you start from specific, you know, nutrients, glucose or whatever, and turn it into your favorite biomass component. But what you did not learn is really how this network of metabolic reactions exists across different cells. I would argue from the proliferation problem, you really didn't understand the true problem of proliferation, which I would say is not about how you get ATP, but rather how when you have enough energy, you decide which nutrient to use and how to allocate them to make different things. And understanding these questions is something that 
I think is going to be critical to, to understand, understand physiology. And yet most of us, when we think of metabolism, really think about metabolism in the lens of how cells get energy. That is how they get ATP. And ATP is of course important for all cells. You can't live without ATP. It's the thing that allows proliferating and non-proliferating cells, cancer, non-cancer, whatever, have the thermodynamic energy, if you will, to do unfavorable things. Now proliferation, you certainly need ATP to proliferate, but to proliferate, most of the energy you need is not actually an increase in ATP. It's actually generating all of the stuff, all of the protein, nucleic acids, et cetera, to duplicate biomass. And really what we and others have argued is that if we wanna understand metabolic phenotypes in cancer, we should really understand them through the lens of what the cancer cells are doing that the normal cells are not. That is those phenotypes likely are telling us about how this problem is solved, not necessarily how the cells actually get, get their ATP. Now, if one goes and actually says, how can we actually begin to study these problems? Now we've heard this from the other speakers, so I don't wanna dwell on it. But I want to point out that most of the tools that we have to study metabolism in different contexts really are most powerful when applied to cell culture. There's been a real renaissance in the last 10 years to try to understand metabolism. Um, and that's largely been driven by the fact that we have great tools. We can do gene expression analysis now and metabolic genes are almost all highly expressed. And so we know a lot about what metabolic genes are expressed. We know a lot about metabolites that are present. We can manipulate culture media and ask what's limiting. And increasingly, we can trace the fate of metabolites and you know, apply those to various other um, uh, methods and math in order to, to, to even understand fluxes. But this is largely most powerfully applied to monoculture. And even though one can go in vivo, and we have done this and others in the field have done this as well, and try to apply some of these same techniques to tissues or whole animals, I would argue that these experiments are quite hard to interpret. In fact, increasingly, I am worried that we don't know how to interpret these experiments and that some of the efforts to interpret them are actually leading to, 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 to some misconceptions and problems in the field because the complexity of how you interpret these things once you get to this mixed population becomes much, much, much more difficult. However, I would also argue that getting this right is super important, at least for the sense of cancer. And that's because we know many of the metabolic phenotypes in culture are not the same as what we see in tumors. A prominent example that we focused on is really this use of glutamine. Effectively, all our cells in culture will use glutamine to support all kinds of aspects of metabolism. And this just is not the case. It's true in some tumors, but it's not the case in all tumors in vivo. And this is not something about adaptation to culture or, 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 or different sites, but rather is somehow environmentally driven. And my group has spent a lot of time really thinking about what determines the specific metabolism of cancer cells. And really what we've come down to is it's really determined by three different things, where the tumor comes from, what the mutations are that cause that, as well as the environment where that, where that cancer is located. And the way we've conceptualized this is that it turns out that this lineage and mutations really is telling us about the network of what enzymes are expressed. And it turns out that cancers will adapt the metabolic network of the tissue where they come from with the mutations largely to create a unique network that allows that cell to proliferate. That is, it takes advantage of the fact that different tissues use different metabolism. And so rather than reverting to some common cancer metabolism, it really takes the metabolism of the normal tissue, adapts it with the genetic mutations and creates a network. But that network just says what's possible. And it's really, if you take that network and you put it in a situation where there's infinite nutrients available, it looks very flexible. But the reality is, is that these networks are constrained by the environment where those cells are located. And it's really those constraints on the environment on the network that ultimately we would say dictates the limitations in the physiology that happens for those individual cells. Now, our models really tell us about cancer. Largely, we think about cancer in terms of where it comes from or what the mutations are. But it's really this environment piece that we think is constraining the physiology is really the 4D physiology. That is, this is determined by interactions with other cells, what nutrients are in the blood or how metabolism or, or, or environments might, might vary across, across different tissues. And so we've been spending a lot of time focusing here on the environment because getting the environment right, I would argue, is really the frontier of this field.
Now we've used a few approaches to do this. We've used mass spectrometry to ask what nutrients are in blood, that's easy, but as well as what's in the fluid, the interstitial fluid of tumors and other tissues. And what we found is, is that those things are not the same. That is each tumor and each different um, normal tissue tends to have a unique nutrient availability in fact, we think this is not really dictated by the cancer itself, but rather by properties of that tissue. And we can use this as a way to study things in either reductionist models, say where we alter tissue culture media, something that was alluded to by in the questions for the last speaker, and ask questions about individual cell populations, or do things such as we've done in diet. We know diet can also affect what nutrients are available in tissues. And so we can compare different diets and animal models that have different phenotypes, ask how they change metabolite availability within tissues, and then use that to triangulate down and basically learn different hypotheses about what might be driving those phenotypes. Now that's great, but where these things really break down is trying to understand what I think this effort is. And that is what are the interactions between individual cells within tissues? And this problem gets really, really hard because we know that if we use the tools we have, they're best applied to bulk biochemical tissue. If we take bulk biochemical tissue, we know there's gradients of nutrients. We know we're looking at mixes of many cell types, but we really don't know how to dissect those. We Various mass spectrometry approaches, tissue mass spec has been mentioned, but this is highly limited in sensitivity as well as quantitation that really allows you to get to these questions. And this gets even harder when one thinks about organ to organ communication as we might see in something like, like cachexia. Yet we know cells are cooperating and competing for different nutrients. And I would argue that all the single cell approaches we have, which largely look at enzyme expression, do not solve this problem. Remember, enzymes do not tell you what is actually happening metabolically. You cannot study functional metabolism just by looking at enzyme expression. And this problem is hard to overcome because of a time scale problem. We can look at RNA and protein because the time to sort cells is such that um, it's, you, these things are stable over that time, but metabolism changes faster than how rapidly we can actually sort cells. Now we've tried to come up with different solutions to do this. One is we can say, well, let's just look at the, recognize that the macromolecules come from nutrients. And so let's not look at the metabolites, but let's look at how metabolites contribute to the macromolecules. And we've even experimented with putting things like, um, you know, putting a vector in so we know metabolites had to pass through specific cells. But I would say these problems are not completely solved and they can be really hard. I think they can be applied to tissue mass spec, but now we're at the forefront of multiple technologies. And one other thing that I just want to throw out there that does exist, and that is individual sensors for metabolites or metabolic state, ATP, ADP ratio, et cetera. These things also exist, but each of these is hard. There's tons reported in the literature and our hands, most are not robust, but I think this is another area where some advances could be made that ultimately may allow us to address um, um, some of these questions and really understand this, this, this metabolic crosstalk better. Apologies from going over. I'm just going to go here because, of course, any work I do is really the work of many people in my group, past and present, and our funding. Um, and thank you guys again for the opportunity to talk. Well, thank you, Matt, uh, for that great talk. Um, I wanted to ask about data integration. I mean, I think that understanding uh, systemic metabolism in the context of cancer is important but it's clear that it's going to require the integration of many different technologies uh, to understand. So what are your thoughts on the best way to integrate, you know, different technologies? Yeah, I mean, I did not talk about this, but this is actually a huge challenge. It's something that any lab who does a lot of this stuff knows, and that is, you get information from what genes are there in the network, you get mass spec information and how to pull all those pieces together. It's largely cobbled together with various open source software, individual <laughs> labs write their own software, we steal it from each other or share it with each other. You know, there's a few companies that have tried to tackle this problem, but I would say there is no one platform. You know, even when we publish a paper, you know, increasingly journals want you to deposit all of your data in repositories. And we, 
you know, I feel strongly about that. We always try to make all of our mass spec data and we publish it available, even if it's in an Excel file that's impossible to parse. But there is no database to put a lot of, I mean, there are databases out there, but there is no one repository. You know, there's no PDB or no GenBank for, for metabolism stuff. And I guess that's an opportunity that I didn't even think about, but it is one that Janelia could think about. Here's a question from Mitch uh, Trumbliski. Can you be more specific about what metabolites need to be sensed and what the problems are with the existing sensors? Yeah, so, so you know, obviously the problems with the existing sensors is that they're not robust, right? You know, many, not, I mean, some are and some are not, right? I'm not gonna call out individual papers or people here, right? I can tell you that there's some of them that we've tried that are great. They do exactly what's billed. And then there's other ones that we just can't get to work the way that the paper says they do. You know, we've focused on looking at things that we care about. You know, my lab has been really interested in redox state. There's a number of NAD and ADH sensors out there. We've tried some, some are better than others. Um, none are perfect. Um, we've cared about levels of, you know, a couple individual metabolites that we've gone out and, 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 and looked at, you know, and look, it's a challenge. Each one of these things is based on usually some kind of fluorescence or fret technology where you couple metabolite binding domains and, you know, these things can be pH sensitive. There's all kinds of things that go into this, but I think there is a way to build these sensors. It's just hard work and in a large effort, I think that is something that could be done. I think we're gonna have to leave it there. There are still some more questions, um, but we're gonna move on for the sake of time. So thanks, Matt. And uh, the next uh, speaker is a selected speaker. So they must be important. Uh, Sarah Crisp from uh, The Hutch. Awesome, thank you so much. I had a, uh, a little mishap right before I was going on to speak. And so I'm working on getting this set up on the second computer. Um, Are you I, ready or? Um, you know, I since I haven't been able to share my screen yet, I'm portion of screen. Yes, I will, um, I can do this. I'm having a cursor problem though. Oh, one sec. Why don't we let Brian go first? Sure, yeah, that, that'll that work fine. Okay, we're I, I, I can go first. If... All right, Brian, uh, from uh, Memorial, uh, go, right at, go right ahead. I'll just need you to confirm if you can see the, the screen. Not yet. Do you see it now? Nope. Let me try this again. Here we go. Yes. Yes. Can you put it um, in uh, full screen? Okay. Great. Okay. So you see the pre presentation? Yes. Perfect. Okay. Okay, cool. Um, well, just to, I guess, kind of lead off on, on, on Matt's talk. Um, first, I really want to thank the organizers for giving me the opportunity to present uh, my work. I think it's a real honor to be a part of this uh, workshop. And the work that I'll present today stems largely from my days as a graduate student not too long ago uh, in Lou Cantley's lab, where I primarily focused on, on the role of genetic instability and altered metabolism and its role in, in metastasis. And we I initially started uh, with an interest in looking at metastasis from an evolutionary perspective, whereby I think it's pretty much well uh, established that genetic instability plays an important role in giving rise to genetic heterogeneity and diversity that ultimately can be acted upon through natural selection by the different ecosystems that define the metastatic niche. And this could be the brain, this could be the liver and the lung. And so it's very much akin to uh, Darwin's original observation of speciation uh, in the Galapagos Islands. So it's really within this framework that we really begin to deconstruct the role of, of, of metastasis, particularly in the context of, of brain metastasis. And we've heard uh, from previous talks uh, yesterday and today that ha have highlighted the, the importance of the interplay between these cellular interactions, whether it be tumor cells and endothelial cells or tumor cells and astrocytes in the brain. 
And these, these cellular interactions, while they are playing an important role, both in a positive selection uh, and a negative selective role in terms of dictating the, the constraints of, of metastasis, um, what I'd like to argue today is that uh, the metabolic environment and the components of the metabolic environment can also play an added layer of, of selection. And understand this composition that integrates both the cellular components, whether it's a normal cell or a cancer cell, is important in understanding how we might devise better therapies and, and selected therapies that might be able to exploit this interplay and this uh, at a tissue level. And just to highlight, um, you know, with novel imaging modalities, it's very easy to, to image cells and the proteins within cells and how they interact with each other. But again, kind of in the field of metabolism, we lack the ability to monitor and, and detect uh, metabolites both intracellularly and extracellularly and how metabolites are exchanged and communicated between cell types. So this is you know, one of the limitations of the field, but I think there's growing interest in, in addressing this issue. Um, and so over the last year or so, there's been a lot of work that you know, has emphasized um, how cancer cells overcome uh, these metabolic constraints in the brain and microenvironment. Work from Adrian Bohr recently has shown that iron sequestration by cancer cells in the leptomeningeal space is important in, in, in tumor cells in being able to establish themselves in this hostile environment. And recent work from, uh, from Matt van der Heiden's lab have highlighted the role that one of the mechanisms by which cancer cells overcome this nutrient limited environment is by upregulating genes that, uh, that enable cells to, uh, to uh, fatty acid synthesis genes to overcome this uh, lipid uh, deficient uh, barrier. And our work recently has implicated also, in addition to, to lipid metabolism, the role of amino acid metabolism in, in brain metastasis. And here we focused on, on the amino acid serine, which plays a crucial role in, in supplying uh, as a metabolic precursor for a variety of different um, uh, biomass molecules. And the reason why we focus on serine is that at least in culture, or at least what was known in the literature at the time is that serine is the second most consumed amino acid after glutamine. It's among the least abundant amino acids in the CSF, however. So that really, really raises the question, how do cells overcome this nutrient scarcity to acquire serine if it's limiting in the microenvironment? And we can uh, use, uh, we can isolate CSF from mice and humans and quantify the levels by mass spec of, of uh, different amino acids and demonstrate that the levels of serine in the CSF is a quarter of which, what it is in, in a plasma and an eighth of what it is in conventional DMEM or traditional conventional uh, cell culture media, raising again the idea or the problem that we have with reconciling what we observe in vitro or what we've been utilizing for years in vitro, whether that has any relevance to what we observe in vivo. But regardless, uh, we know that serine is important for as a metabolic precursor for lipid synthesis. It's also utilized uh, to synthesize proteins and other amino acids. In addition, it plays an important role in one carbon metabolism, which provides uh, it's an added role in, in the regulation of epigenetics by supplying uh, one carb uh, methyl donors that facilitate uh, methylation reactions. It's important in redox homeostasis. And what I'll emphasize here in my talk is that uh, serine is also a major metabolic precursor for the synthesis of nucleotides, particularly purines and pyrimidines uh, that sustain cell cycle progression. So again, coming up with this idea is like as an individual metastatic cell that seeds the, the brain, how does it transition from a single cell to two cells and then eventually a group of cells that eventually form a, a, a metastatic outgrowth. And so to address this question, we've adopted a, a, a technique that I think a, the audience is largely aware of. It's an in vivo selection strategy that allows us to uh, develop and generate tumor cell lines that hone into the brain, but have different efficiencies at, at breaking out into large uh, macro uh, metastases or at least detectable metastases. And using uh, proteomic uh, uh, analysis, we were able to identify that the rate limiting enzyme in uh, glucose derived serine synthesis, PHGDH, or otherwise known as 3 phosphoglycerate dehydrogenase, was highly uh, upregulated in aggressive brain metastatic variant. So, this gene is or the glycolytic intermutes of glucose into serine. Uh, thereby bypassing the need of extracellular serine or the nutrients available in the environment. And we were able to validate this uh, in a variety of models, including 
breast cancer, but also went along and, and showed that this pathway is upregulated in melanoma and lung cancer as well, lung cancer brain metastases. And metabolically, we can confirm that it's not only just the expression, but the, the expression is correlated to increase in activity by uh, using uh, isotope tracing of glucose so we can feed cells or mice glucose and monitor the conversion of glucose into serine and compare it to uh, our non-aggressive uh, variants of brain metastases and showed that uh, when cells are implanted either in vivo, in vitro, uh, that uh, these cells do indeed uh, have a higher propensity to convert glucose into serine. And we were able to show that uh, suppression of serine, uh, of PHDDH, uh, attenuated brain metastasis. And importantly, uh, we, we showed that this was selective to the brain uh, tumor microenvironment because overexpression of a catalytically active uh, variant of PHDDH enhanced uh, brain metastasis selectively to the brain and not other tissues. And we were also in the fortunate position to be in the development of uh, PHDDH inhibitors that were able to potently inhibit PHDDH and demonstrate at least in vivo that we can both prevent or delay uh, metastatic spreading to the brain and also in the treatment setting with established metastases. So while these findings I think are important and potentially has clinically relevant um, implications, what I found equally interesting was that our results informed us a little bit about how metabolism functions in vivo. And to, to borrow some, uh, a viewpoint from uh, Matt's uh, uh, review recently, uh, this kind of raises the question of, of metabolic demand and nutrient availability. Um, when metabolic demand exceeds um, what's available for the cell, either by de novo synthesis routes or by what's available in the microenvironment, it provides us an opportunity to intervene therapeutically, but either through uh, the use of, of uh, pharmacological perturbations that can enhance this metabolic and demand to uh, propel the cells into a state of crisis. And so, and then, you know, PHDDH in the context of brain metastasis, we believe serves as a recalibration step uh, where it's able to maintain a competitive advantage in this nutrient depleted microenvironment and enable cells to proliferate in an otherwise hostile environment. Conceptually, I think this also provides uh, unique opportunities for the, um, and targeting metabolism in brain metastasis specifically. What I've shown you uh, is that PHDDH inhibitors function in part by uh, inhibiting uh, PHDDH in tumor cells, but there's also the possibility that PHDDH when administered systemically can target uh, systemic circulating levels of serine through inhibition of de novo serine synthesis in other tissues such as the liver. And of course, this raises the question whether dietary interventions can also modulate the therapeutic efficacy of targeted agents targeting PHDH, or can be combined with uh, currently approved therapies that we know that are used commonly for the treatment of breast and lung cancer, such as polycyclic that engage the uh, cell cycle regulator CDK4 and 6, or function as a radio sensitizer given its role in nucleotide biosynthesis, whether combining these modalities uh, may function as a, as a radio sensitizing agent for the treatment of brain metastasis with radiation. So uh, to kind of summarize the work, uh, I think to and echo some of Matt's point uh, is that while cell intrinsic factors come to define a, a certain metabolic network that a cancer cell is capable of using, the way this network operates is constrained by the availability of certain nutrients in its microenvironment. Therefore, identical cells, um, whether they're breast cancer cells growing in the brain or the lung, may have different metabolic uh, environments and exhibit different metabolic programs and variations in their metabolic dependencies depending on the environment that they reside in. Likewise, different cells in the same environment may exhibit similar metabolic programs and phenotypes. So for example, melanoma colonizing the brain May, is, may be similar to a breast cancer colonizing the brain and therefore may exhibit uh, commonalities and, and response to therapy. And of course, uh, just to acknowledge um, some of the work that was done, this was largely done when I was a graduate student in Lou Cantley's lab. Uh, and and it, this was done in close collaboration with Mike Packold and, and Matt Van der Heiden's group and, uh, at MIT. And then just to close, uh, just to bring up some points that I think we, we touched on upon, Briefly, um, that stems on you know, metabolism and its role in, in 4D physiology. 
one question is, you know, can metabolites function as a signaling molecule and how can we use chemical proteomic or mass spec based approaches to annotate these functionalities? Uh, how do we perturb and monitor specific metabolites directly in real time in vivo a single re resolution? Are there genetic approaches that we can use to create sensors to monitor these uh, crosstalk and these activities? Uh, and how full, faithful are our, is our co current uh, cell culture medium at recapitulating human physiology? Um, and then by focusing on these tissue specific uh, dependencies, can we tailor or identify new therapies to target cancerous tissues specifically to avoid toxic side effects? And so uh, with that, I'll take any questions. Thanks, Brian. Uh, quick question. Did you try to see if a, a serine and glycine free diet would limit uh, metastasis? So we haven't, uh, we've tried that. We never published that, that study. That study, I think, was eventually shown to be uh, by Karen Valston recently, but I don't think she looked at metastasis specifically, but she was able to show with uh, a steering restricted diet that you could expand the therapeutic efficacy beyond the tumor microenvironment. Okay, we have a question here from uh, Cynthia Hajal. Um, very interesting presentation. Is there evidence of the effect of PHGDH inhibition on metastasis to other sites, not just to the brain? So in our hands, um, I think there was some recent work by, um, there's some recent work that has implicated uh, PHGDH role in lung metastasis as well. We never were able to see a therapeutic efficacy uh, or diminish uh, in terms of lung metastasis. But I think some, some uh, groups have argued that there might be a role in, in, in lung metastasis that is not necessarily dependent on nutrient availability per se. I think some of these results are confounded uh, by the different inhibitors are, that are used. Um, some of the early generation inhibitors are more, are thought to have more um, toxic or more side effects. So I think I have to look closely at, at which of those inhibitors were used. Okay, from um, Shin Shu Sain Shu, um, glycine is a um, also a inhibitory neurotransmitter. Uh, could the tumor cells be secreting glycine to alter neuronal function? Yeah, so I think that's a really good point and something that was touched upon yesterday. Um, it's interesting that when you monitor or look at glucose-derived serine and glycine um, in intracellularly, it's about 30% maximum. So 30% of the glucose gets converted into serine. But then if you also look at the extracellular conditions, you'll also identify glucose-labeled uh, serine and glycine that's in, almost present in equal amounts, 20 to 30%, suggesting that 60% you know, of, 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 of glucose-derived serine synthesis is occurring. Whether that has a role locally in, in the tumor microenvironment, I think is an intriguing possibility, but not, uh, I'm not aware of any uh, direct studies that have looked at that. Okay, from Cyrus Gahar, um, how, how extensive and how long would you have to have a restricted diet uh, to have an effect? Um, and how would you translate this approach in humans? So how long, so how long the restricted diet? So in our studies that we've done, we've usually do a pre, like a two week uh, normalization of the mice on the control diet and the serine glycine diet before any perturbations are administered. And then we'll continue that. But the, the problem is that the mice, I think will tolerate the serine glycine diet alone quite nicely. There, there will be some weight loss initially, but they'll recover. But when you place them on a, on a inhibitor, they actually lose um, some weight and, and we're, we're, we're required to take them off, off the inhibitor. Um, so okay, well, on the diet end itself, there, I think it's, it's fine. Yeah, we, we, there are more questions, but I think we have to move on. Uh, so Sarah, um, is your, are, your, are you ready? It was wonderful. Why don't you take it away then? How do I? <laughs> um, oh my gosh. I'm still muted. I need to click on the. Yeah. Uh, yeah, um... I know. Oh my God. 
Not muted. Now you're muted, Sarah. Now you're muted. Oh, now, okay. Oh my God. You're good. I never used Zoom before. Yeah. <laughs> okay, now, now we're up and running. All right. Um, without further ado, my name is Sarah Christ, and today I'll be sharing with you our research on the role of oxidative stress in the skeletal muscle niche. And as we're all aware, metastasis is the process by which tumor cells disseminate to and colonize distant sites. And breast cancer in particular exhibits a preference for metastasizing to specific visceral organs like the brain, lung, and liver, as well as to bone. And our field is largely concentrated on the molecular underpinnings of such hospitable microenvironments that promote metastatic outgrowth. However, knowing the opposite could prove equally as useful to combat metastasis. And by that, I mean, what constitutes an inhospitable soil? Despite numerous organ op options for metastatic colonization of breast cancer shown here on the x-axis, we largely never see the emergence of skeletal muscle metastases. And as skeletal muscle makes up approximately half of our body mass and is well vascularized, the rarity of metastases here is remarkable. At face value, muscle seemingly has every opportunity, if not more, to host metastases compared to these other organs. Then why don't we get skeletal muscle metastasis? My project is really centered around this question of how the skeletal muscle niche suppresses tumor cell outgrowth. But first we wanted to investigate whether or not tumor cells were actually even able to traffic to and persist within the site. And so we profiled different organ sites of mice that had been intracardiac injected with the human breast cancer cell line, the MDA and B231. And I was able to find that there is a distribution of tumor cells throughout the body at both early and late time points. And what was most important to me was that of two or three muscle sites I sampled, I was able to find tumor cells. And this implies that tumor cells do traffic too, as uh, implicated by early time points, and persist within, as implicated by late time points, that uh, tumor cells um, are here in the skeletal muscle. But to begin untangling why these cells in muscle then don't grow out over any period of time, we first looked at metabolism. And there's been growing evidence to suggest that metastases evolve towards the metabolism of their host tissue. And so we had designed an experiment to define the metabolic adaptations that are required for colonization of skeletal muscle. And we thought that this might reveal metabolic obstacles that prevented metastasis to the site in the first place. And we took advantage of the fact that though infrequent, the 4T1 mammary cancer cell line does occasionally result in, in metastases to muscle. And so leveraging this biology, we derived a skeletal muscle tropic 4T1 cell line that routinely formed uh, metastases to muscle. And metastases derived from skeletal muscle and lung metastases derived from this muscle tropic cell line were excised as along with tumor-free counterparts and ran for metabolomics. And to understand the metabolic adaptations that were required for colonization of skeletal muscle specifically, and taking into account tissue-specific nuances, we normalized the metabolites found in the skeletal muscle metastases against the other three conditions shown here. And interestingly, one of the most enriched keg pathways that, we, that came up was glutathione metabolism. And we know that excessive ROS uh, can lead to significant damaging oxidative stress if there's not a counterbalance of antioxidant compensation. And we became really interested in this question of um, redox balance in the context of disseminated tumor cell biology. And so to gain direct insight into oxidative stress, we examined the ratio of reduced glutathione, GSH, to that of oxidized glutathione, GSSG. In the resting cell, the molar ratio of GSH to GSSG exceeds 100 to 1, wherein, whereas in various models of oxidative stress, this ratio can decrease by one to two orders of magnitude. In our data set, we saw that the healthy skeletal muscle tissue exhibited a much greater buffer, redox buffering capacity than that of the healthy lung. But what we found to be really interesting was that the metastases derived from the skeletal muscle also had this greater GSH to GSSG ratio compared to that of the lung metastases. And we thought that given their common tissue of origin and the likelihood that tumor cells that seed muscle and lung start at the same oxidized state, largely based on Sean Morrison's work showing that circulating tumor cells uh, traveling through blood are already uh, highly oxidized and highly stressed, um, that the substantially elevated glutathione, the GSH to GSSG 
ratio of the skeletal muscle metastases could possibly be interpreted in one of two mutually exclusive ways. Now, first, these data might suggest that tumor cells that are capable of colonizing skeletal muscle experience less ROS in the tissue and therefore have less a need to oxidize GSH to GSSG. However, it's also possible that persisting within skeletal muscle requires tolerating increased levels of ROS and thus only DTCs that have and can maintain this high level of GSH to GSSG ratio are able to colonize this tissue. And if true, this could extend to mean that the vast majority of DTCs in muscle can't make this adaptation, fail to neutralize the tissue's higher ROS burden, and are effectively frozen in a single cell state. So moving forward, we sought to determine which of these interpretations was correct. Are DTCs in skeletal muscle growth restricted because of the sustained oxidative stress? And to determine whether tumor cells in the muscle environment did exhibit signs of oxidative stress, particularly in the context of glutathione metabolism, we employed this glutathione specific uh, redox sensor called ROGFP2. And we looked at the, um, the oxidation state of the MDAB231 cells in the lung and muscle of mice after seven weeks post intracardiac injection. And what we found was that, yeah, indeed, skeletal muscle DTCs found within skeletal muscle are highly oxidized. But we, what we thought was also very interesting was that the DTCs that we found in the lung microenvironment were also highly oxidized to that same extent. But what is important to know is that upon uh, that this oxidation was resolved upon the course of metastatic progression through the lung. And these data lent further credence to the idea that DTCs might start at similar oxidation states regardless upon dissemination, but must subsequently balance their redox state in order to colonize a given site. And this motivated functional studies to determine first whether or not sustaining oxidative stress could prevent metastatic progression in sort sites like the lung, and second, whether enhancing antioxidant reserve could enable tumor cells in muscle to colonize this otherwise hostile environment. And in the interest of time, I'll just say that we have ongoing studies using a chemogenetic system of tunable hydrogen peroxide and see that the colonization of lung is abrogated when sustained oxidative stress is imposed. But for the rest of my talk, I want us to think about what the consequence of restoring anti uh, redox balance to tumor cells inoculated into to muscle might be. So we engineered cells to ectopically express catalase in their mitochondria. And catalase acts similarly to glutathione, but unlike glutathione, catalase can accomplish detoxification without the need for cofactors or co-substrates. And so we thought this modification was going to be particularly effective. And so using these, uh, this mitochondrial catalase vector and comparing it with control, we in, uh, intramuscularly injected the EO771 mammary cancer cell line into mice and tracked tumor burden over time using bioluminescence imaging. And what we found was that um, there was a robust increase in the mitochondrial catalase cohort um, with skeletal muscle tumor burden by three weeks compared to control with five of the 14 mice having full-blown skeletal muscle lesions. And these data show that restoring redox balance can actually overcome proliferative barriers imposed by muscle and substantially enough in some cases to facilitate full-blown colonization of the tissue. And now one might expect at this point that increasing tumoral catalase could just lead to an increased metastatic potential irrespective of organ site. But this actually doesn't seem to be the case. Using an intravenous model of metastasis, we observed that the catalase expressing tumor cells did not increase tumor burden in the lung compared to control, nor did it increase the metastatic foci number shown here. And these data highlight how redox interactions between a DTC and its microenvironment aren't equal across tissues, and that disrupting the redox balance too far in either direction can substantially impact colonization. And so in this short time, I've shown you just some of the highlights that has led our group to believe that sustained oxidative stress can drive a profound redox imbalance in DTCs and muscle, and that this poses a very unique problem to these single cell DTCs. And there's still a lot left unknown in my project and sort of in the field at large. And so I'd like to leave you with, with a few thoughts. Um, you know, my work is largely focused on skeletal muscle, but how do other anti-metastatic niches like the spleen maintain control over these disseminated tumor cells? And thinking about metabolism, 
you know, what what is the meta, the met metabolic landscape of DTCs in both these metastatic sites, but as well as these anti-metastatic sites. And this has been a really hard thing to tackle first because people aren't looking at anti-metastatic sites, but how can we capture the metabolism of these rare populations of cells? They're hard to find. Um, and as a lot of other people have already mentioned at this point, metabolism is so dynamic. And at the point that you've removed that cell and found it, the metabolism most likely has already changed from the one you're trying to, to capture. Um, but I think it's really important that we understand if there are metabolic commonalities within these DTCs um, across these sites, because that might lead us to think about the therapeutic vulnerabilities of these cell populations. And I think just to conclude thinking about, it's really important to come back to the microenvironment. How does the microenvironment shape metabolic behavior? And I think it's important for us to think about how this changes with metastatic progression from the single disseminated cell and then how the environment shapes, how that evolves or responds um, as they progressed from micrometastases to macrometastases. And with that, I just briefly wanna thank the other uh, members of the Gajara Lab and the collaborators here at the Hutch and UC Denver for, for all of their support. And I will happily take questions and thank you for listening. Thank you, Sarah. I have a quick question. So mm -hmm. the NRF2 is a master regulator of oxidative stress response. Yeah. It's an oncogene, the inhibitors of it are tumor suppressor genes. So is there any genetic evidence that uh, metastasis to certain sites is favored by activation of NRF2? Yeah, there was, um, oh man, there, there is this one, there's one recent paper that was looking at the role of NRF2 in breast cancer recurrence um, at the at the primary sort or sort of residual disease. Um, I believe that was Fox et al. I can't remember um, sort of the specifics of that, but it, it does seem to be that there, um, there, there's a lot of research in these different antioxidants or the, the regulators of redox that um, show just how important it is for this, this type of metabolism to be finely tuned because in, it, you know too much of a good thing in either direction can really lead to different consequences. So here's a question from um, Matt Vanderheiden. Uh, Sean Morrison has showed overcoming oxidative stress is critical to survive in the blood. How much does this contribute to the ability to reach muscle in addition to thriving at the site? Interesting. So the question, if I understand it correctly, is is there is there already a disadvantage? Um, because of the stress in the blood that perhaps more cells don't even initially survive once reaching an art, an, another site that is stressful. Um, you know, I think that's a really fascinating question. It's hard to say, but from some of the studies that I've done with looking at sort of an early dissemination to muscle, it suggests that the distrib distribution of um, DTCs that I find in muscle are not, is not that actually that different from other, other organ sites looking at a three day um, times like a, a time sampling. Um, so I don't think it's necessarily, um, I, I think because there is this type of stress in the blood, it, you know, it, that is already the disadvantage. I don't think it's an extra disadvantage for then seeding muscle. Here's a question from Prab Sangupta who wants to know, um, does oxidative stress, um, affect the immune response? You know, uh, good question. I haven't looked. I, I think the answer has to be yes. I think everything affects everything else. So I think that, um, you know, because ROS really are such a immunostimulatory uh, molecule, I would, I would imagine that it would be, yeah. But I, I have no, uh, no data to support that. I'm going to butt in here and point out that muscle, as opposed to the lung, has a very rich network of tissue resident macrophages that tend to preserve uh, the function of the skeletal muscle against neutrophilic infiltration. And if the uh, disseminated cells begin to grow and they damage the skeletal muscle that exceed the carrying capacity of the resident macrophages, you get a neutrophil response and then you get a lot of oxidative stress. So have you looked for neutrophil infiltration and whether there's any course correlation between where you have single cells versus invasion? I, I have not looked. I have there. There's so many aspects to the microenvironment that you know. In trying to understand one, 
well, it's, I've tried to not, you know, increase the variables by thinking about metabolism. And, and so that that's sort of a, a cop out answer to say, no, I haven't looked at the immune system in muscle um, because it's, you know, I, it, it's a very challenging question to even study one thing. So, but a very good thing to think about in the future. All right, thank you, Sarah. That was that was great, and I'd like to thank all the speakers for fabulous uh, presentations. And I guess now we go into the discussion session. Um, maybe I could start off the discussion by uh, pointing out um, some future directions. I think tumor microenvironment and can the cancer metabolism field need to go in, uh, and we didn't have it discussed too much uh, during uh, this session, but I think we can do a lot more work in humans. Uh, you know, we know that cancer is a, you know, obesity is a risk factor for certain cancers. We know that caloric restriction uh, protects against certain cancers. Uh, we have a complex situation where we have circulating nutrients, different tumor genomics, that can affect metabolism, the microbiome can affect uh, the anti-cancer immune response and you know, metabolites that are in the circulation. Uh, so I think that uh, it, it would be very valuable to ask some of these questions in, in human cancer patients uh, where you know, we don't have to worry about whether or not the model is faithful or representing uh, the true situation. So I just like to throw that out there and that if, if these types of studies are advanced, it's gonna, gonna require an enormous amount of coordination. So, so Eileen, I can chime in here and make a comment about that because I, I agree with you completely because, you know, our models are imperfect of these things and they're good models for some things, but not for others. That's a theme. And obviously, if we want to affect humans, you need to go to humans. The challenge is, is that it's hard to go the way materials collected in most at least human cancer studies is not very useful for studying anything beyond looking at metabolic genes. And Looking at metabolic genes only gets you so far. And so if you want to ask other functional things, you have to collect stuff in different ways or do it. And, you know, I put in a lot of effort with people to try to do these things because, you know, it's important to do, but there, an, an effort is needed to do it up front because we can't go back to our retrospective banked stuff because th that stuff has been collected to look at things that are cell intrinsic, not things that are functional across tissues. I'd also just like to add to that. I think that not only are our mouse models um, problematic and limited in, in what we can extract from them, but also our ability to analyze humans is not great, you know, with the tools we have available. So one thing that I mentioned is that, you know, using BMI is not really an accurate measure of metabolic syndrome. I mean, I really only scratched the surface in my presentation of why that's the case. I mean, it's based on white European men many, many, many years ago. So we have uh, huge problems with certain demographics of people like uh, older women or people from different parts of the world that are not classified correctly. So how do we even make sense of um, human studies if, if that's our goal is to move towards the human situation? I mean, I do think there's a computational opportunity here for things like diet, for instance, you know, diet data is collected in some of the larger cohort studies. The issue is, is that the way that data is collected, I would argue is quite biased because it's based on the preconceived notions of what people think is healthy. And for the people on this call who are my age or older, they know that, you know, in the 1980s, what was viewed as a healthy diet is very different than what's viewed as a healthy diet today. And the people who came up with those ideas were as passionate about them being true as the people are today, right? And so in the end, there are certain things that we don't know well. And if we collect data in a way that, you know, asks, so are you eating this type of diet or that type of diet? Even that is somewhat biased. And 
that was necessary if you were going to analyze it using metrics where you have to ask specific things. But when you have machine learning and artificial intelligence and some of the approaches now, I think it's easier to ask things in a much less biased way to get to human information for things like diet or lifestyle, but you need to have a large effort in order to really pull this off. But I think it is something that is possible maybe going forward that wasn't possible in the past and may give us some insight that, that, that otherwise we wouldn't have. One, one thing that's also challenging with diet is it's largely based on self-reporting and you depend on um, compliance. And I mean, I don't know about you, but if I was surveyed about how active I am, I'd probably kind of lean towards exaggerating compared to what's reality and what's actually going to be meaningful for research. And that's the case with a lot of people. So, um, you know, that, that applies to diet and how healthy we perceive ourselves, but also how we perceive our, our lifestyle and our activity level. So is there any insight into why obesity or metabolic dysfunction predisposes only to certain cancers? So, I mean, there has been, um, there are various different hypotheses of why that might be the case. Um, one is that it might be certain cancers are a little more sensitive to BMI inaccuracies. So for example, lung cancer patients, often one of the first symptoms is that they have weight loss from cachexia um, at the time of diagnosis. And so whether this shift in BMI impacts the way that uh, retrospective epidemiological studies are interpreted, I mean, that might be something that's kind of more, you know, lung cancer is a little bit more um, sensitive to. The other fact is there might be a biological basis for it, and we just don't have the tools to study it accurately. So it's really difficult to uncouple those two scenarios and figure out what's really going on. But I do think that it's a really important part of research that we don't understand at this time. So generally, what are the... Um, I guess, best opportunities that we have in the cancer metabolism field in terms of visualizing uh, metabolism in the tumor microenvironment spatially. You know, I brought the, the imaging mass spec up yesterday and we heard it mentioned in Donita's talk and in Matt's talk. So what are, what are your feelings on, you know, the, the how, how this is going to be, how is, it, how is it going to reach the single cell level and how useful do you think it's going to be? I mean, personally, I think it will be useful because it gives you information that you didn't have before. You know, I think the problem is it's destructive. So you miss the time component and it's not quantitative, at least not in the current iteration. And those are technical challenges and analytical chemistry that may or may not be solvable. Um, but, you know, getting that spatial component is going to be important. But I think the biggest challenge of it, though, is I don't see how you get to the 4D part, the fourth dimension part of time, because you cannot look over time, right? You have to destroy the sample to look at it. So I haven't heard well, that well, Matt. ramen anywhere. So how far can Raman approaches get you? They're non-destructive. You can do them over time in various tissues. You can't look at as, at as many different things probably as the um, all the MS, but you could look at quite a few uh, interesting metabolites by that technology. And that also lets you do label-free measurements in a way that gives you cellular resolution at the same time. So rather than staining. And so is that something that the group has uh, begun to approach? I mean, others can comment too. It's not something that, ha it's something a few people have done. It hasn't been done a lot. And I, I really like that, Ron. Um, I would say there's other, you know, autofluorescence is a way to look at redox state. That's something we've started to do collaboratively with some other groups. Um, and you can learn some powerful things that way. And it is label free and it, you can even go and look directly at tissues in animals, right? It's possible to do those things. So, so it's probably been underutilized by our field, some of those things. Um, 
And part of it is because the people who do that well are not necessarily the people who often think about, at least in the cancer metabolism world, are not always there, but that's an opportunity, I agree. I had a question for Danita in terms of the probe sets that she was developing. Are any of those adaptable to MRI? Not PET. It's one color. MRI, you can push to a couple of colors by changing radio frequency um, when you're doing it. And so if they're non-toxic, then you have the potential to go and measure a couple of different parameters uh, in vivo in humans and at repetitive time points. So where does that stand? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. The way that we've mainly uh, utilized these, they, they all have an alkaline handle. So if there's something that you could click on that would uh, allow for you to do MR-based uh, approaches and then, and then make them functional by having different probes that will react with sp specific metabolites or cofactors, you could multiplex them in, in that fashion. So um, that's something that we're exploring, exploring now. To date, we've re really used uh, fluorescence or um, photo other photo affinity uh, tags in order to do them uh, to do the imaging. But th that's an excellent point. Hey, Ron, you have your hand up. No. Yeah. Um, yeah. I just wanted to zoom into the cellular level again. And um, one thing I haven't heard that much about is. Um, metabolic exchange between cells. Uh, and we saw also these, and also proximity to nutrients. So we saw the, these incredible movies yesterday about you know, tumor cells crawling along uh, capillaries. Um, so you know, how much metabolic sharing is there between cells or, or how much or little do we know about that? There clearly is metabolic sharing. There's different uh, ways that that's been demonstrated um, that occurs at the level of the stroma, you know, the stroma feeding the tumor or a metabolic dependency between the local tumor environment and the tumor cells. Uh, but it goes beyond that. There's evidence that a tumor can change uh, metabolism in the liver. Uh, uh, there's evidence that well, in cancer cachexia, you have systemic metabolic uh, perturbation that's induced by the tumor uh, that causes uh, significant degradation of host tissues. So, so I think that in the cancer metabolism field, that's one of the biggest uh, questions that remains to be properly addressed is nutrient sharing between tissues and the tumor, and how is that regulated? And that obviously can only be done by in vivo experiments. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's it, people have shown it, Ron, they've shown it, but it's been mostly with, you know, it, it's hard to show rigorously what is being exactly shared between different cells. Like I'll, I'll go out and say that, right? It's you can come up with systems where you can show that sharing might exist or competition likely is happening, but to really show something is coming in one cell and actually being shared directly with its neighbor, that's really hard. And that's why I was saying, like, I think, you know, how to show that we don't really have the best technology to do it, right? We've, we've, we, we and others have come up with different ways to build model systems or look at this or test the possibility that these things are going on. But if you really want to ask at a cell next to another cell level, things like the movies you showed yesterday, that's what I was at least advocating for. I think you need some kind of genetically encoded sensor to look at it, to look at something about what's actually happening. Now, some of those things are science fiction in terms of what how you could envision that sensor working. But nonetheless, I think you need something like that. Yeah. And let me just comment on that because I think I have a couple ideas or, or thoughts. Um, um, yeah, I think you hit right on the dot is that unlike proteomics, for example, where you can label cell types specifically with, you know, whether it's an alkyne group or things like that and watch them how it's, it's traded back and forth between different cell types, we really lack that ability in, in metabolism. And so therefore, I think, you know, an alternative strategy is, you know, to come up with sensors. And I think, Matt, you alluded to 
some of these protein-based sensors um, that can be utilized. But one of the ideas that I've been working on and is to use, you know, you know, RNA or DNA based encoded sensors where you can express or their, you can uh, enhance their selectivity just by using in vitro selection systems. Uh, but then the question becomes like the dynamic range by which these are you able to detect that? And so I think that's also another limitation. I don't think you're going to be able to detect everything, every metabolite, but maybe certain classes of metabolites that are induced by certain stimuli or at, at least within the dynamic range. So dynamic range, I think is also another challenge. I don't know if, have you tried using um, any of the RNA based sensors, Matt? Or DNA based sensors? We have not tried those, so I can't comment on them. So Adrienne, you have a, your hand up. Oh, so I guess this is just drawing back to this earlier discussion about kind of whole organism questions. Um, and it seems to me that we do have granular data on those tissues at a whole organism level. We have the clinical chart, right? So we have a rich source of data that we just don't use. We pull out these tissues, we freeze them or we FFPE them. And then we don't look back to see a kind of basic information about the organism that the tissue came from. And that doesn't require self-report. It doesn't require a, a data, you know, anyone telling us what they ate. It just requires us to look at the blood work that was already collected, the basic characteristics of the patient. So it's a, it's a big data problem, but I think it's certainly within our grasp computationally. I agree. I also think moving in that direction and, and trying to look at systemic markers using, um, you know, good biobanks that have been curated is also a move in the right direction. Um, I don't think most people are doing this. And I think translating it to mouse models is what's going to be the real challenge, because I don't know how relevant, uh, you know, the mouse model, a mouse model is in, in um, recapitulating some of those systemic effects. I want to go back to this issue of sensors. If we really want to understand whether nutrient exchange matters for the behavior of, a, of an adjacent cell, since most of these are going to enter the cell via a specific transporter, you can engineer individual cells with degraders that turn off those transporters at a fixed time. And you can do it in mixed populations. So you have individual cells scattered in the environment. So you're not sort of turning everybody off at one time. And you can have link reporters to be sure you've turned it off and know which cell you've done it in. And then ask, is that cell going to die or change its behavior compared to others and, and, and impute what's happening from the neighboring cells? So I think there are strategies now that would allow you to probe these. Now, that's obviously in mouse models, not in, in human tissue unless you do it in an explant, which has its own problems. But I think rather than trying to just measure whether something is there, actually looking at whether it matters um, is almost more addressable right now. Now, it's true that transporters often are for classes of compounds rather than one particular nutrient. And so you have to take that into account. But I think uh, one could get a lot of information uh, about what these cells are doing and whether neighbors are doing things in uh, at a single cell resolution by using that type of approach. Ron, Matt, I love you have that. your hand up. Yeah, I was just going to comment on what Ron said. I actually really love that approach and I think it's powerful, but I think you have to embrace the complexity of the transport system if you're going to do this well. And I think you know, many of these transporters are not as well understood as you might think. And exactly what the transporters are transporting and in what direction is also <laughs> not so clear. For instance, I'll give you an example. There's the neuron astrocyte lactate shuttle is based largely on expression of specific monocarboxylate transporters and inferences about that. And that field has been its own there's been arguments in that field that go back decades in terms of just starting with that point. And amino acid transport, something that a lot of us have thought about who think about cancer, you know, there's two types of amino acid transporters, but they mostly transport many different amino acids. There's the ones that concentrate, but the vast majority of them are exchangers, which means that what's outside and inside determines what is exchanged in which direction. 
And so you have to know that information to know how the transporter is working. But with that said, embracing the complexity and doing that, I think there is opportunity there to, to do things, particularly because you're right, you can degrade them and ask what matters, right? Any last, any final comments from anyone on the panel? I think Peter Sorger might be trying to say something. Those are methods. If you're trying to say something, maybe you should unmute yourself. <laughs> I just know he's worked on transporters. That's why I thought I saw him briefly trying to do it. But it looks like he might have been having technical problems. So. All right, right, I think then. we'll uh, close the session here then, Eileen. Yeah. Does that sound good? That sounds great. So when do we come back? So uh, let's take a just a five-minute break, and we'll resume at um, 1255. So we'll see everybody then. Okay. All right, everybody. I think we will go ahead and resume with session six. And to do that, I will turn it over to Ron Vale and Xu Zhen Xu, both from Janelia, who will be um, chairing and uh, leading the discussion for this session. So um, Ron, perhaps over to you. And it will be quickly over to Xu Shen, um, who will be um, uh, the main moderator for this ses session. So uh, Xu Shen. Okay. Thanks, Ron. Um, it's my pleasure to moderate this session on imaging, which is mostly what I've been doing for the past 10 years. Um, so let's welcome our first speaker, Eric Sahai from Francis Crick Institute. Hi, so uh, I hope you can all hear me. I'm sure I'll get a message if you can't. Um, so I'd like to yeah, thank the organizers for uh, inviting me to participate in this very stimulating uh, you know, uh, forum for, for discussion. And I realize this is uh, the imaging session, but I guess I have a little bit of a confession or an apology to make, and that is that I'll actually show some of the most low-tech imaging of you know, the, the whole meeting. And uh, part of the reason for doing that is that um, I'd actually like to kind of concentrate a little bit more on you know, some of the challenges that I think you know, we're facing up to in terms of uh, you know, using imaging to get information that will then enable us to do things hopefully in the longer term to improve the outlook for cancer patients. So uh, before I kind of kick off, I should acknowledge um, all the uh, people who have contributed to the work whose names you can see on the left here. So a big thank you to them. So really what we'd like to understand is, you know, why uh, tumors look uh, the way that they do. And what you can see in the background on this slide is a mucosal squamous cell carcinoma stain with a cytokeratin stain. And you can see it's invading down into the surrounding tissue, sometimes in large clumps here or in other places in rather kind of, you know, thin strands. And, you know, I think, you know, the reason why we're interested in this, or, you know, why we care is because, you know, encoded within this sort of spatial pattern that you can see uh, you know, on the screen now is um, you know, uh, links to you know, the phenotype of those tumors and in particular their metastatic propensity. And you know, uh, to sort of, uh, be blunt about it, you know, this is why pathologists get paid um, because they can look at the pattern that you see in a section such as the one that I just showed you and make some sort of a call as to you know, whether or not that you know, patient has a a good prognosis or a poor prognosis, or what types of treatment might benefit them uh, the most. So, you know, what uh, you know, I think we're particularly interested in in terms of being able to use that imaging information for is, you know, how we might be able to get better at describing the spatial organization of the tumors and uh, not wishing to pick on the pathologists anymore, much as, you know, I love, you know, interacting with them. Uh, it's not something that I can, you know, do at scale and, you know, uh, kind of compare across uh, diseases. I also have to admit that occasionally I find the language a little bit uh, baffling as well. So, uh, you know, in the first sort of you know, few minutes, I'd like to kind of address this question of how we can get better at describing the spatial organization of tumors. And really, you know, if I had a, you know, a wish, you know, I would love, you know, it to be as simple as comparing transcriptomes because, uh, you know, we've heard, you know, many beautiful talks say, you know, Makala does a, a gene expression, you know, uh, 
RNA sequencing experiment, it's relatively straightforward for you know, me to compare that with a gene expression experiment that we've done. And you know, there's the GEO database as you know, repository. And this has really you know, transformed our ability. You know, in the background here, you can just see you know, comparison of gene expression between different organs and different species. But it has, you know, uh, in our research, enabled us to kind of make you know, jumps that we would have never made previously just by comparing nucleic acid sequences coming from this transcriptional data. So this is what I would love to be able to do for you know, tumor images, to have it be as uh, facile as it is to compare transcriptomes. So this really gets to the point that we need you know, quantitative descriptors of pattern. And uh, I think this is you know, increasingly established for you know, point source sort of information. So if we consider you know, the cell as the thing that we particularly care about, and we've seen some beautiful sort of you know, uh, highly multidimensional you know, imaging of various tissues. But one kind of particular interest of, you know, my group is, you know, the extracellular matrix. And in a large part, you know, this is often filamentous structures. And actually, the quantitative uh, descriptors for, you know, filamentous structures is lagging a little bit behind in terms of its uh, kind of degree of sophistication uh, compared to that for sort of, you know, point source information. And ultimately, we need a framework that incorporates both point source information and, you know, that of filamentous structures. Just to give you a, you know, a little heads up of the sorts of things that we're you know, doing in this direction, and this is done by Esther Wershoff, who might actually be on, on the call today. We're looking at you know, a, a breast cancer sample here. This is stained for the extracellular matrix. We extract you know, that fibrous uh, you know, uh, kind of network, and then we can analyze it with a range of you know, different uh, you know, kind of, uh, metrics. And some of these are listed here. And then with these in mind, we can start to do sort of you know, dimensionality reduction things, and we can start to generate the types of, you know, t sne plots that I think we're all familiar with for, you know, kind of either single cell RNA sequencing or other, you know, classes of nucleic acid data. And this enables us to have some ability to, you know, pick out, you know, at least crudely, you know, uh, different, you know, types of, you know, tissue, whether it's normal, you know, adipose tissue adjacent to tumors or, you know, fibrosis versus uh, tumor material. So yeah, I think this is a start and I would you know, love to have this you know, at much greater scale. And obviously, you know, relating back to the point about you know, why pathologists are important, we can take some of these metrics and start to relate them to clinical outcomes as is shown here. So one of these metrics, at least in a discovery cohort, seems to be associated with worse prognosis in breast cancer patients. So you know, I guess you know, so far so good, you know, if we can you know, uh, describe the patterns uh, we can then start to classify, you know, different tumors and ask what's you know, similar to other tumors um, and also how it might relate to what happens to the patients. But, you know, ultimately what we would like to be able to do is actually understand how all of this pattern emerges, because you know, if we want to be able to change, you know, these sort of structures that you can see, you know, in front of you here, uh, we really need to know the kind of, you know, the, the rule book or whatever uh, that, you know, determines uh, this structure in the first place. So, you know, we really need to understand how they form and how they can be uh, reorganized. And uh, I haven't really told you what you're looking at here. Again, this is another of these mucosal squamous cell carcinomas, uh, now stained for a tumor microenvironment component, alpha smooth muscle actin, which highlights the fibroblasts, some of which you heard about from Shannon Turley yesterday. And she was showing you a very nice movie of this sort of you know, marginal region of a tumor where the T cells were kind of going backwards and forwards because they were migrating at least you know, uh, alongside these highly aligned fibroblasts here instead of going into the tumor, which would be potentially more useful for the patient. So just kind of you know, quickly, I'll talk you through some of how we're you know, trying to you know, understand you know, how patterns form. And essentially we're borrowing from various you know, other idea or other areas of biology. So you know, obviously you know, genetics is something that can be leveraged and just relating back to that first slide that I showed you, you know, looking at cytokeratin, this is actually now in a breast cancer model. You can see you get very different patterns of cytokeratin staining, so the, the cancer cell staining, depending on whether breast tumors have e cadherin present or e cadherin is mutant. And actually, this is really a defining characteristic of a subclass of breast cancer known as invasive lobular carcinoma. And obviously, if we have good metrics for spatial organization, it becomes much easier to correlate those with you know, genetic features you know, that are extensively characterized in you know, TCGA and other atlases. The other thing that you know, we're, I think, increasingly you know, doing as a community is watching you know, the emergence of you know, form you know, uh, kind of, you know, in dishes and in particular in 3D environments over time. And this is just a you know, I think, rather 
famous and beautiful image from Madeleine Lancaster, you know, on one of these you know, mini brain organoids. And we can do the same sort of thing with cancer. And this is something that we've been doing for you know, many years. And actually, it's remarkable if you, you know, give a few cells you know, a little bit of you know, opportunity to express themselves, as it were, actually, you start to get you know, relatively realistic patterns. So this, again, is a breast cancer that you can see here. We put some breast cancer cells. This is a very well-known cell line just in you know, a collagen-rich matrix in 3D. You start to get some lumen forming. But all we actually have to do is just add some fibroblasts. And I hope you can appreciate that we're now starting to get patterns that are somewhat reminiscent of you know, the in vivo tissue context. And this gives us a great system for unpicking some of the communication mechanisms that occur between those you know, uh, different cell types. And also because we can watch this in time, we can really see where things go wrong if we break some of those communication mechanisms. And actually, you know, we and others have you know, uncovered a wide range of you know, diverse mechanisms by which different cell types uh, communicate with each other in the tumor microenvironment. And we've heard many or much about many of these uh, in the last day and a bit. So just kind of, you know, finally, the thing that uh, I find actually you know, the biggest challenge, but also the most exciting thing is, you know, trying to understand if we have all these cell types communicating with each other in diverse ways at the same time, what is, you know, the resulting pattern. And actually to you know, tackle this, we're increasingly kind of engaging in agent-based modeling and actually borrowing, you know, types of models from other areas of biology. So this rather beautiful image you can see here is a shark trying to catch its dinner. And these are, you know, beautiful kind of you know, highly you know, organized you know, shoals of fish that are escaping from it. And this is actually a little bit you know, like the organization of those fibroblasts that I showed you, you know, uh, a couple of slides back. So we can you know, adapt the same framework that has already been you know, used to understand you know, how you know, fish you know, um, coordinate their behavior and see if we, by just tuning some of that model, we can get things that look like parallel arrays of fibroblasts. And what you should be able to see in pink here, this is more with parameters akin to fish, you start to see things that you, know, you could imagine looking down in a pond and seeing some fish swimming around. But we just tweak one parameter and we get something that looks at least much more like how these cancer-associated fibroblasts behave in a culture system. So this tells us how actually pattern can be formed using relatively simple rules. It also gives us a window into how once pattern is formed, if we change one of those parameters, can we reorganize the structures that we see in a way that might be beneficial to uh, you know, actually the outcome for that particular cancer patient. So this is, I think, you know, bringing things to a close. You know, what we really want to do is you know, reorganize tumors for patient benefit. And you know, to do this, we need to understand how these patterns can change over time. And I think this really speaks to the fourth dimension that is you know, a theme of this. I hope you know, I've shown you a little bit about how we you know, try to use approaches to get you know, mechanistic knowledge about how you know, patterns and tumor organization you know, arises. And then we use you know, inference and modeling to try to work out what the key you know, uh, linkages or communication uh, mechanisms that we might want to infer with are. And obviously longitudinal sampling, particularly in patients if possible, has a key role to play here. So this is just a kind of a final plea to say that, you know, I really think that actually to glue all of this together, we need quantitative descriptors as a necessary tool. And hopefully this is something we can discuss a bit later. So I will uh, finish there by thanking you uh, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Um, thanks, Eric, for the excellent talk. As a pathology myself, it's very fun to hear about a talk that I may become unemployed very soon. <laughs> Um, I think, to, oh, we have one question here, but I was wondering about um, the question about how, how patterns emerge. And do you think an approach such like, um, if we just go back a little bit um, further in time, like we see one cancer cell, we see the small cluster of a cancer cell in the normal tissue, or ultimately we can gene genetically manipulate a small like breast acini to alter some of the driver genes and to induce tumor formation just in that specific locus and watch over time. Do you think that approach can be fruitful? So yes, I think you know that was what I was trying to you know uh, allude to in terms of you know having interventions that you know will uh, you know disrupt the system and particularly if we can apply them in a time controlled manner, we get a lot more information than if that inter intervention or that gene is just lost. You know, from uh, you know the, the very beginning, and I think that you know is a, a, a key thing. Just to clarify, I don't want to make pathologists you know uh, redundant. I want to make you augmented. 
Oh, right. We just run computers and like, get paychecks. Yes, well, we have a question from Probs Sengupta. Um, how uh, do we know if different cancer cell characteristics um, it's a very long, uh, in different parts of the tumor, for example, um, boundary versus core of the tumor, are there transitions of perimeter states across the tumor mass? If so, then this information can be a possibly used device intervention strategies. Yeah, so um, good question. Uh, yes, I think there are differences between tumor cells at the edge and at, at the center of tumors, perhaps best studied in types of colorectal cancer where there's you know, some evidence that they have either a more mesenchymal or a more stem-like state around the edge of the tumors, potentially a sort of aberrant recapitulation of that crypt villus structure. And then we have a question from Ron. Have you tried agent-based modeling with different cells, epithelial cells, and fibroblasts with different perimeters? Uh, yes, yeah. So this is something uh, I, I didn't show today, but it, uh, we're very kind of actively engaged in that. And also we've been working on having the fibroblasts in particular kind of deposit and change extracellular matrix structures. So we can then uh, you know, see how the matrix uh, kind of builds up over time. And in a sense, because the matrix, you know, is much slower, it's almost like a kind of a, you know, a memory or a spatial memory. And actually the challenges in reorganizing matrix are probably harder than the challenges in just getting cells to change position. Uh, we may have one question, I want the time for one question left. Jennifer is asking what resolution of organization do you need to have to draw key conclusions about drivers? Yeah, so I guess, I think cellular resolution is kind of what you know I'm most interested in. And that's not to say that you know the subcellular you know, uh, you know uh, kind of environment is not fascinating as well. And I think just you know perhaps one one final comment. You know, there's a big drive to just kind of endlessly throw machine learning approaches at you know images. Um, I would kind of sound a little bit of a note of caution. I would actually like to have a sort of a, a hybrid way of doing things where you know you kind of at least put in you know cellular information or matrix information into those machine learning models so that they're anchored in things that you know I as a you know a tissue or a cell biologist recognize such that I can then go back and try to build hypotheses and have interventional approaches. Um, but I think it, you know, it's a multi-scale problem. That's my personal answer of what I'm most interested in. Okay, let's thank Eric and um, welcome our second speaker of the session, Dorothy Sipkins from Duke University. Hi, I'm going to say a quick visual hello and then I'm going to turn off my video because uh, I'm sharing bandwidth and I don't want everything to collapse. Okay. Okay. Okay, can everyone see that? Yep, looks good. Super. Okay, so I'm gonna give you a very broad whirlwind overview of our experience using imaging to study the tumor microenvironment, and uh, I hope it will illuminate some benefits uh, and challenges that we face. Uh, our lab's been particularly interested in the role of TME in cancer decisions, uh, including proliferation versus dormancy, therapy resistance, uh, and metastasis. Um, so my lab has used intravital imaging to study these processes and we'll jump into why I think it's been useful. Uh, by the way, these comments are not in any way meant to diminish the, the real uh, value of in vitro modeling and helping to define these processes and we use these ourselves. Um, but of course they have their, their own limits that have uh, been discussed. Um, so why in vivo imaging, the tumor microenvironment and the tumor are richly complex, three-dimensional, ever-changing. So one, it's quite challenging, requires a lot of expertise to recreate many tissues in a dish. Uh, it, creating vasculature alone is very difficult, uh, considering also that there are distinct, functionally distinct capillaries, veins, arteries. For many tissues, we don't know all the components of the extracellular matrix, the different cell types, soluble factors, et cetera. Uh, and as was uh, discussed yesterday, important effects uh, also occur through crosstalk with distant organ systems. 
Uh, number two, a snapshot's not an entire story. As we all know, a cell is found. But where did it come from? How are things changing over time as tumors grow and remodel their microenvironment? Uh, number three, uh, ex vivo tools are not ideally sensitive to detect dormant micromets that we are particularly interested in. Uh, and we've seen this in correlating our imaging work with uh, flow and histologic data. Um, Number four, it's, it's also difficult to tease apart direct versus indirect responses to systemic therapies and seeing the response of a cell to an intervention in, in real time, uh, whether it migrates, whether it dies, uh, this can be very insightful. Um, so in our lab, we've been using uh, particularly intravital confocal and dual photon microscopy to address uh, some of those limitations. Uh, the benefits to this include uh, single cell resolution, temporal resolution. There are many different fluorescent labeling options, reporters uh, available, uh, transgenic mice, uh, and compared to other imaging modalities, uh, it's, it's relatively affordable. Now, the biggest drawback to light microscopy is that you can only go a few hundred microns deep with the photons, um, but you can be resourceful. In our situation, we're, uh, and I'm a hematologist, uh, oncologist, by the way, um, we're very interested in the bone marrow microenvironment, uh, which can be hard to image through thick bones. Uh, but fortunately, in the mouse, the skull bone is exceedingly thin. And after reflecting the scalp, one can image through the unmanipulated bone, and you can obtain uh, very nice uh, images of the, the marrow beneath. Now, uh, frequently you need to be more invasive. Uh, we have a particular interest in disease that's metastatic to the meningeal membranes that lining the brain and spinal cord. Uh, and placing standard skull window there would actually obliterate some of these membranes. So other groups in our, in our group have carefully thinned down the overlying skull to allow imaging of the underlying leptomeninges, um, which you see here in this uh, Z stack. Uh, you heard yesterday from Michaela about advances as well in imaging windows for other visceral organs um, with a, a prior major challenge having been inflammation that can be induced by these materials. Uh, I, I'm just going to skip over this uh, for time. Um, so. Uh, Fast imaging in, in, in real time is, is a real a boon, a powerful technique, uh, allows us to watch cell migration in the TME in action. Uh, many of these events uh, are actually quite rapid in both liquid and solid tumors and um, uh, therefore relatively easy to collect. And this is a 30 minute time lapse video of uh, breast cancer tumor cells moving through their tumor microenvironment. And I'll show you an example of the utility of uh, real video rate imaging in just a moment. Um, to visualize elements of the, of the host, one can take advantage of, uh, as I mentioned, transgenic reporter mice. Uh, however, when, when these are either unavailable uh, for the target, difficult to make, uh, or there's uncertainty uh, as to the key elements of the, of the TME that you actually want to uh, explore, um, we've, we've used uh, intravenously delivered fluorescent antibody in vivo labeling approaches, kind of an in vivo immunohistochemistry. Um, and here you can see an example of vascular and P selectin labeling uh, that was done uh, in living mice. Uh, we've also used this approach to label extracellular matrix molecules uh, in living animals. In this example, in purple of osteopontin, which is uh, a matrix molecule highly enriched on bony surfaces in the, the bone marrow. So uh, what have we learned that we would not have otherwise using uh, this technology? Um, so I'd like to give a few examples. Uh, first, an, an example of the value of watching cellular events in, in real time. Uh, so in this study, um, which you see some snippets of, we injected fluorescent leukemic cells intravenously, and then we immediately uh, imaged the bone marrow um, to look uh, at their, their homing there. Uh, and we were able to appreciate on imaging that leukemic uh, cells and later solosumer cells uh, home to very restricted areas of the bone marrow. Uh, you can see over here, uh, and that they uh, that they showed uh, evidence of interactions with specific molecules um, that had very localized expression on what turned out to be uh, highly specialized sinusoidal blood vessels. And if we'd done standard homing studies where we just counted total numbers of cells harvested from the bone marrow, uh, I honestly don't think we would have been able to to make this insight about these uh, specific vascular gatekeepers. Uh, and a second example, this is uh, the value of serially imaging the same uh, mouse and area uh, in a tumor in vivo over time. Um, and this, uh, this study uh, was uh, 
uh, based on an unexpected imaging observation that arose from our ability to track cells, uh, hematopoietic stem and progenitor cells over time in an individual mouse. And we were able to show that um, HPCs migrated from normal host bone marrow niches uh, to molecularly deranged leukemia bone marrow niches. Um, and again, the uh, imaging observations were really essential to our formation of hypotheses here. Um, third, uh, just very briefly discuss the value of, of highly sensitive uh, light microscopy. Um, so this image is of uh, very rare dormant breast cancer micromets in the bone marrow. Um, and in this study, we used a very simple label retention imaging strategy to identify them in their niche. And it's not as elegant as the strategy uh, that Anna described yesterday. Uh, but in any event, uh, finding these dormant micromets on uh, bone marrow imaging in the mice is, is quite easy, but by flow or histology is, is quite laborious, uh, laborious and, uh, and sometimes uh, really a needle in a haystack endeavor. Uh, and so uh, lastly, the power of visualizing responses uh, to treatments, interventions in real time. Uh, and then here we were able to show that dormant breast cancer cells in the, the bone marrow could be released from the microenvironment and forced into the bloodstream by uh, inhibition of a single uh, microenvironment tethering molecule, uh, CXCR4. We imaged mice uh, pre and, and post drug in the same mice. And because we were looking at the same mice uh, in the same areas, we were able, we, we had little doubt as to whether, whether cells in the tumor microenvironment uh, responded uh, and actually where many of them went, in this case, into the bloodstream. And, and these are, if I can activate them, these are uh, videos pre and post uh, CXCR4 inhibitor of tumor cells in red that have mobilized uh, into the bloodstream. Uh, and you can see them if, if, uh, if you watch long enough, you can catch them on the right uh, circulating in the bloodstream. Um, and these are actually quite rare cells. And so being able to, to do this uh, in vivo uh, really facilitated uh, quantitative measurements. Uh, I, I am going to skip this last one uh, in the interest of time, and I, I actually can't see my timer. So uh, if someone could tell me how much time I have left to go on and discuss uh, barriers and wish lists for tools. You have about uh, a little over a minute. Okay. About a minute. Yep. All right. Rolling. Um, so, you know, based on our experiences, uh, this is kind of a short, uh, a short but important list of uh, of barriers and things I, I wish we had. Um, and one is imaging probes for where light cannot go on its own. Um, and so multi-photon near-infrared imaging uh, can get, uh, get you deeper, but you're still talking about uh, a few hundred microns. Um, and as we saw in, uh, in yesterday's uh, talk, Anna's talk, um, you know, what happens at the surface of a tissue versus millimeters and more inside a tissue uh, can be very different, different. And so it would be, Fantastic to have optimized miniaturized objectives and scan heads uh, to go to, to sites in the body uh, that aren't reachable otherwise. And this has been done to some extent with endoscopic probes, um, but to go further in this uh, sci-fi direction would be amazing. Uh, second, better tools uh, to label cells and molecules in vivo, um, and particularly for stromal uh, and ECM uh, elements, uh, as, I, as I said, and we know there, there are many reporters and transgenic mice, um, but these can be uh, you know, very time consuming uh, to create, and sometimes don't work well enough for uh, imaging purposes. Uh, as I showed you, fluorescent antibody labeling is great, but um, you need to have the right antibody. It's got to have the right pharmacokinetic specificity of it. Uh, nanoparticles hitched to antibodies can help a lot in delivering payloads for, for imaging uh, fluorophores, um, but they have their own issues in being able to penetrate to the targets uh, and evade the reticular endothelial system. Um, so a toolkit here uh, would be phenomenal. Uh, another thing uh, in terms of you know, uh, being able to do prolonged animal experience, experiments, engineering advances that, that can support uh, the mice through these experiments would be would be great. Uh, anesthesia creates hypothermia, blood flow and tissue oxygenation changes uh, and current setups to monitor uh, mouse vital signs and such are, are, are expensive and, and not very easy to use. 
Um, and then, uh, you know, one dream experiment is you asked us to talk about dream experiments. Um, uh, for me, it would be a, a, the ability to extract individual cells uh, from precise locations during a live animal imaging and, and be able to analyze these uh, ex vivo. Um, people have, there are examples of people uh, doing this, um, but, uh, you know, it, it's really very challenging to, to execute uh, at this point in time. And so, again, this is kind of a, a bioengineering uh, wish list. Uh, or this aspect is. Um, and then finally on the wish list uh, for, for me as a, a clinician uh, you know, are ways to translate the imaging advances that we made in the mice uh, to, to people. Um, you know, new imaging probes to define uh, tumor molecular profiles at multiple sites non-invasively. This is very important due to problems of tumor heterogeneity, biopsy uh, issues, sampling errors, differential responses uh, to therapies at different metastatic sites, um, new ways to find micrometastatic disease using imaging uh, could be wonderful. Uh, yeah, obviously, there are advances being made in liquid biopsies, cell-free DNA, um, but there are limitations there as well, needing mutations and, and to identify and such. Um, and then also new ways to uh, assess tumor dormancy uh, or interventions that might affect that in, in clinical trials uh, and biomarkers for this. And this is because those types of clinical endpoints points uh, take a long time to get to, and, and certainly that uh, dampens the enthusiasm uh, for pharma in, in carrying out these kinds of trials. Um, and so I'm not all about light imaging uh, in- uh, Dorothy, I'm sorry to interrupt. I'm done. <laughs> okay, we'll stop. We're only gonna have about a minute left for questions. So that, that would be great if you could wrap up quickly. Thank you. I can, I can entertain the questions right now. Thank you. Um, we have a question from Liang. How much resolution do you think it is necessary for using probes to go where light cannot go? Um, something like photoacoustic imaging can penetrate um, centimeters deep, but lack cellular resolution. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that's, you know, it's, it's always the, the trade-off and that was the trade-off that we experienced, you know, using something like MRI, which you know, can give you images for the whole entire organism, um, but you have a signal to noise and, and resolution issues. Uh, you know, it really depends on the question that you're, you're trying to answer. Uh, and the organism that you're doing it in. Um, you know, if you're doing it in a, in a human, you, you, you need to be able to, to go all over the place, really. Um, and because, uh, as I mentioned, you know, the tumor, the, no patient has, with, no patient with a single diagnosis, I think, actually has a single tumor. You know, there's clonal evolution, uh, and then the tumor behaves differently at different sites, uh, depending on its microenvironment, as, as I think we all can appreciate. Um, you know, if you're talking about a mouse, uh, you know, that, uh, you know, being able to go centimeters, that's, that can be phenomenal, right? Because that lets you get through a lot of uh, uh, different structures. Um, and so, uh, you know, it, it really depends on um, your question and your, your system. But, uh, um, you know, I think all these different uh, things can, can come together. Um, but yeah, thank you for the question. Yeah, I think because of time, we'll move on to our next speaker, um, Kate Carbone from Genentech. Hi, thank you. All right. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Kate Carboni. I'm a postdoc in the cancer immunology department at Genentech in Ira Melman's lab. Um, and I've also been working extremely closely with Christine Musion and her group also at Genentech. Um, so I'm very grateful for their collaboration and support. And I also wanna thank the organizers for this opportunity, um, Dorothy, Eric, Shushan, and Ron for some really helpful and, and stimulating discussions in advance of this section. Um, so today I'd like to share with you a new preclinical tumor model developed at Genentech and how we're applying in vivo imaging in the system to understand the tumor microenvironment. Um, so by now, I think it's well established in this workshop that nascent tumors sculpt their surrounding stroma in order to create a local microenvironment that promotes tumor survival and progression. And specifically, tumors can exert tolerogenic effects on proximal immune cells by modulating cellular function, infiltration into tumors, and recruitment to malignant tissues. 
Um, so at Genentech, we think a lot about how tumors influence their microenvironment in the context of how patients respond or fail to respond to cancer immunotherapy. And ultimately, cancer immunotherapies rely on robust recruitment of effector cells into the tumor microenvironment. Uh, so Shannon Turley nicely introduced this background for you all yesterday, but I'll reiterate a few points. Um, the first is that a really key piece of data helped frame how we think about patient response to immunotherapy. And that was the observation that across multiple cancer types, patients in Genentech's trials of PDL1 blockade that fail to respond can present with one of three patterns. Um, and these are immunological ignorance, a non-functional immune response, or an excluded T cell infiltrate. And this hypothesis has been further refined as the cancer immune set point um, presented by Daniel Chen and Ira Melman as the desert excluded and inflamed immunologic phenotypes. And as Shannon Turley summarized for us yesterday, these uh, patterns can be therapeutic manipulated, therapeutically manipulated to achieve response to PDL1 blockade. So we're beginning to understand the phenomenology of these phenotypes fairly well, but it's been a challenge to define the precise mechanistic underpinnings. Um, is it you know, the genetics or epigenetics of the tumor? Is it caused by elements of the host or perhaps the tumor microenvironment? It might be stochastic. Um, and ultimately, we needed a preclinical model for the different phenotypes that preserves the spatial organization in which we could examine tumor initiation, progression, and rejection. Um, so practically, we needed to address the trade-offs between um, assays that look at spatial, temporal, or functional information and, you know, a, a weigh that against the invasiveness or repeatability of the assay. Um, so existing technologies, which you've heard a lot about over the course of this workshop, um, have found different optimums within this space. But Christine Musian realized the potential of in vivo imaging to, to achieve the best of all worlds for our purposes. So this brings me to the STAMP tumor model, short for Skin Tumor Array by Microporation. Um, and in this model, we use an infrared laser device to create a grid of micropores in the mouse ear. Um, next, we apply a suspension of tumor cells in matrigel, uh, and then uh, that will seed an array of about 20 to 50 tumors per mouse. And the ear is an ideal site to implant these arrays because the tumors are superficial. Um, getting over that problem that Dorothy was just talking about, about the depth of imaging versus the resolution we can achieve. And the ear can also be easily immobilized for in vivo longitudinal imaging, enabling these tumors to be non-invasively interrogated for up to a month, um, all while preserving that spatial information we're so interested in. So this is some example data um, to show the types of imaging we can do in this model, looking both at high resolution imaging uh, for single cell behaviors. Um, and I'm showing here an inflamed tumor with T cells in white and the tumor shown in blue. And I should note that the data I'm presenting today is using a mouse pancreatic ductal adenocarcinoma orthotopically implanted through STAMP. Um, and here, this is an immunocompetent mouse in which endogenous CD8 T cells harbor a genetically encoded fluorescent label. And we can also see the first really key observation from this model, which is that the different immune phenotypes can coexist in neighboring tumors within the same mouse. So here I've highlighted an immune inflamed tumor, and you can see the overlap between the T cells in white and the tumor cell fluorescence. And just nearby, there's an immune excluded tumor where the T cell fluorescence is confined to the periphery outside the tumor margin. So to examine this, this model in more depth and in a therapeutic context, I developed computational tools to detect and classify these tumors by their immune phenotype. Um, so with this data, we can plot the tumor cross-sectional area over time with the phenotypes overlaid. Um, so here you can see tumors that largely progress in the control and are predominantly rejected in the immunotherapy condition. And we can also represent this data as a hierarchically clustered heat map of the immune phenotype at each time point. So here the hue represents in yellow desert, in red excluded, and in green inflamed. And the intensity corresponds to the T cell abundance. So this led to some really interesting observations. First, not only can neighboring tumors in the same mouse have different patterns of immune recognition, but they can also experience different outcomes of tumor rejection. Um, so this is shown here in the area growth plots that you know these tumor trajectories that collapse to zero 
um, can often be immediate neighbors to tumor trajectories where those tumors are continuing to grow. And next, we made the observation that immune recognition is not static over the lifetime of an individual tumor, but rather tumors can transition between states of high immune infiltration, shown as the inflamed tumors in green, and low immune infiltration, shown in the desert or excluded tumors in red. And lastly, um, using this model, model to monitor the immune response to cancer immunotherapy, you can see that this conversion to the immune phenotype in green is associated with spontaneous or drug-induced tumor regression. So in the heat map, regardless of treatment, and this is you know, control in blue or uh, treatment in teal, you see that um, the, the complete responder or partial responder tumor group are primarily converting to that inflamed phenotype before being rejected. However, if you then examine the tumors that are classified as stable in progressive disease, there's also a population here that converts to the immune inflamed phenotype and fails to be rejected. So we've applied a lot of interesting computational modeling approaches to understand this data. And what we noticed, which I think you can see here in the heat map too, is that these progressing tumors convert to the inflamed phenotype quite late when we compare those to the inflamed tumors in the responders group. And given there's this important kinetic aspect to T cell recruitment, we became increasingly interested in how tumors are attracting T cells and where that defect lies that leads to inflamed tumors that are failing to be rejected. So an obvious candidate was to look at CDC1 cross-presenting dendritic cells because they're known to be an important source of signals to direct T cell mediated anti-tumor immunity. And they're also associated with favorable response to cancer immunotherapy. So to multiplex the stamp technology, we began to visualize multiple immune cell populations at once. Um, we've leveraged this immunodeficient RAG knockout mouse model with the genetically encoded fluorescently labeled CDC1 population. So these are XCR1, um, CDC1. Uh, and then we also perform adoptive transfer of GFP expressing CD3 T cells. So here, these are T cells shown in green. And now we can monitor not only the T cell spatial phenotype, but also the underlying dendritic cell behaviors by high resolution microscopy or their gross spatial patterns. And this imaging adds another layer of complexity to our analysis because what we observe is that like T cells, dendritic cells can be recruited to stamp microtumors in the same desert excluded and inflamed patterns. So at the top here, there are only very few dendritic cells in the vicinity of this microtumor. Um, so it's classified as a desert. Beneath this tumor is considered excluded. Um, and at the bottom, this is a DC inflamed tumor. And interestingly, there wasn't a one-to-one -one correspondence of the dendritic cell phenotype and the T cell phenotype. So I'm showing here two tumors that exhibit a clear dendritic cell excluded phenotype um, based on the localization of those XCR1 positive dendritic cells. Um, but what you see is that this one presents as T cell inflamed and beneath this is both dendritic cell and T cell excluded. So I think this shows nicely that STAMP enables the measurement of immune cell distribution within the tumor microenvironment to define patterns that are favorable or unfavorable for tumor rejection. And ultimately, this will be a platform for us to untangle what are the different recruitment signals that are influencing dendritic cell behavior, and then how does that feed forward to affect T cell behavior and tumor rejection? Um, so we can now ask, you know, does this dendritic cell excluded T cell inflamed pattern account for those tumors we saw in our original experiments that fail to be rejected. So I'd like to leave you with the idea that STAMP is a model to non-invasively interrogate key aspects of cancer immunity, including dendritic cell function. Um, and given the focus of this workshop on revealing conceptual and technical barriers, um, I want to allude to some of our current ongoing efforts where we're trying to use STAMP to pinpoint the specific molecular nature of these phenotypes by combining these imaging experiments with more conventional endpoint assays requiring tumor dissociation. And of course, we'd also like to explore and validate our molecular understanding directly through imaging too. Um, and to this end, we're working on methods for cellular engineering and looking to more advanced fluorescent probes, um, including I should mention GCAMP, which has already been foundational to our understanding of the system as a reporter for T cell mediated cytotoxicity, um, though I didn't have time to show that data today. 
So finally, and most importantly, um, I'd like to acknowledge the wonderful teams that I've gotten to be a part of. Um, Christine Moussian and her lab really graciously brought me into this project and have been wonderful to work with. Um, specifically Lupe, um, who uh, began this model and Marcus and Chimo, who made really foundational contributions um, to the high resolution imaging and the genetics transcriptomics aspects of the story that I didn't have time to show today. And of course, I'd like to thank the Melman Lab here at our first socially distanced gathering, who've been a tremendous uh, source of support and to Ira for his leadership. And last to Genentech and the postdoctoral program um, for being a wonderful training environment. Thank you. And if anyone has any questions, I'm glad to answer. Um, thanks, Kate. Uh, we have a question from Haiti. The stamp model in a way lead to more ethical mouse experiments since the tumor burden for the mouse is very small. I'm sorry, what was that? Um, does the STEM model um, would give us a more ethical mouse experiments because the tumor burden for this mouse uh, is very small, relative small? Sorry, I think I'm having connectivity issues. Would you mind repeating the question? Yeah, since you're only putting a very the stamp assay in which a small piece of tumor is put into the ear, uh, would it would that result in more ethical mouse experiments or in terms of uh, animal welfare stuff? Yeah, um, I mean, I think that's a, you're uh, selling this model for me, um, that I think we can achieve this, this high throughput type of data without needing to use, you know, I showed, I think about 600 tumors per condition. And obviously that's, you know, about 12 mice, it's not 600 mice. So it does really allow us to access those questions in a more ethical way. Thank you. And um, next, we have a question from Pei Liu. Um, using the STEM model, do you often see DCs in an excluded environment but have a T cell inflamed environment? Um, is this more common or this is the inflamed environment um, more common? Yeah, so I'm still working on really the proper high throughput quantification of this. Um, I think the most common phenotype is for dendritic cells to be localized at the periphery of the tumor. Um, but I think, I, I don't think I've really deeply captured all of the time points. And so it's possible that that's still variable in my understanding there might evolve. Next, we have a, a more data analysis question um, from Cynthia Esposito. Uh, technically, which computational tools are employed in the image analysis pipeline to distinguish between these um, three states? Um, so first of all, shout out to the open source microscopy community because we could not have done any of this without um, the tools that other people have made available. Um, so right now our work is pre predominantly um, workflows that are managed in Fiji and Omero. Um, and then We've explored, so I have a, a custom trained UNET model developed in TensorFlow for the tumor segmentation. Um, and then we're also starting now to transition to using the cell pose model for, for segmentation, both of which have sort of pros and cons. Um, and then in terms of the spatial phenotype classification, you know, what we're doing right now is really not sophisticated. We're um, you know, sort of looking at an averaged line scan around the tumor to create sort of a distribution profile and then classify that based on ratiometric cutoffs. Um, but this, you know, absolutely is something that could be pushed forward with more, more sophisticated methods. Uh, thanks, Kate. We have about six seconds left. <laughs> Should we move forward to the discussion? Yeah, that's a great idea. Okay. And um, for the discussion, Ron and I brainstormed a little bit. <clears throat> Since this has come up a little bit, excuse me, yesterday, we would like to pose this question to the um, panelists and the, um, um, what do you think, what type of new information can we gain from long-term imaging of tumors? For example, we can do like, um, if it's possible, we can do a biopsy every day and to get that aesthetic image, but at certain intervals, um, so versus just uh, versus a long-term imaging of the same tumor over time. Um, for example, in Kate's um, data, is um, there's some uh, fluctuations um, in the tumor cell states. So I think that also gets to the question: What's the temporal resolution where we need to extract the relevant or important information?
Eric you can go first for this question. Yeah, I mean, I think it, it's a very important question. It is, I guess if I've understood it correctly, then um, particularly for immunotherapy, but also for other classes of therapy, what we're really trying to do is transition one type of tissue organization into another. And uh, I think that really, you know, um, needs information from these sort of longitudinal studies about what the possible rates of transition are. And even if all transitions, you know, are always possible, uh, because it may be that actually you know, we can identify, you know, two different states, but you know, there doesn't seem to be any route, you know, to transition between them. One takes ideas about, you know, um, differentiation of cells into to different lineages, right? Actually, if you want to kind of um, transition one lineage into another, you have to go all the way back to an IPS and then back again. So I think um, the longitudinal information should provide that to us, which will help us to design better strategies and stop us pursuing strategies that might be fundamentally impossible. And Dorothy also wants to... Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, yeah, no, I was just, uh, I was just thinking on this, it's, uh, you know, uh, it, that's a, it's, it's a complicated question because there's so many different transitions within tumors. Um, so, you know, as, as tumors grow, you get transitions in terms of the, how effective immune responses are. Uh, there are dormancy to proliferative switches that occur at time points uh, uh, often unknown uh, or very, very expansive, the variants. Um, there's vascular transitions as we all uh, recognize angiogenic switches. Um, and then these cell migration transitions when, you know, uh, cells decide to, to go or, or grow. And uh, I, I guess I'm thinking in my mind, uh, you know, I don't, I don't know how exactly to answer that question. When we've, when we've done a lot of experiments, you know, we, we bookend things the way you would in, in any experiment on the bench top, you know, you, you set up some time points, you know, beginning, end, and in between reasonable numbers where you kind of look for these different types of changes that you're interested in and then kind of figure out, you know, where do I need to, to really focus, focus down? Um, because obviously we, you know, there, there's, there's a limit to how much you can look at over time. So, uh, but it, it's a great question and it's one that uh, challenges in, it, us in the lab certainly, um, and, and especially since you know, a lot of our experiments are what you call low throughput, right? We're, we're not, to, you know, we're imaging one mouse at a time. And, and so, you know, we have to be, uh, you know, careful about what time points we, we choose um, or we'll never get the studies completed. Um, it's a really good question though. Um, yeah, I, I think if I can weigh in too, um, you know, looking at tumors at all time scales is going to be really interesting. And it becomes, I think, a trade-off of what is feasible in humans and what is feasible in preclinical models. Um, and I think one of the things about preclinical models is obviously it enables this higher rate of sampling, but it also enables you to look at an unperturbed state. Um, so with a lot of the sort of assays that would be done in human, you're looking in the context of like a, a treatment, of course, um, and also of often quite invasive um, biopsies or things like that, which in themselves can, can influence the, um, the tumor microenvironment. So um, yeah, ultimately I think the answer is that all of these approaches are gonna be necessary. And, and as we can get higher and higher temporal resolution, it um, may reveal some of the genetic networks that underlie endogenous changes in tumor microenvironment that could create hypotheses about how to then design drugs or perturbations to induce those changes. Let me make a comment that follows on things I said yesterday uh, and then rephrases this question. As elegant as STAMP is, you've picked a couple of parameters to look at in part because your imaging method is usually limited to four or five parameters using the current instruments and the current methods. So you have to make a guess at what is going to be important irrespective of how long you do the imaging in order to see what's happening. Now, you know T cells and dendritic cells matter, so that those are good choices there. But for the other things, we don't know. And I'm a little concerned that 
we're hearing a lot of push to start with a hypothesis, which was classic, it's been classic science for a long time, but there's been a paradigm shift to using highly multiplex assays to get as much information as you can and then extract what you might not have thought about from it. And I'd like to hear more discussion of how to get uh, a lot more measurements, including over time, at, but uh, of many more parameters, and then try to figure out what really matters rather than picking the one you happen to have as your favorite and just following it. Because that's really yeah, the, I mean, I the challenge, think... right? Not to use the existing tools, but to develop new tools that let you look at many more things over longer periods of time and then extract from that the changes that are in the matrix, changes that are in the stroma, changes that are in innate and immune populations. And if we ever could get the right tools, the, the changes in the metabolomics. We've heard about all those, those parameters here. Um, yeah, I think, uh, I think you hit the nail on the head when you said yesterday about, um, you know, with the imaging, you ultimately need more readouts. And so having this sort of endpoint, um, you know, more in depth, more um, discovery based assays that you can then relate to what is actually being monitored. Um, and then doing that in a back and forth kind of way is, is absolutely critical. And yeah, to be able to have sort of the resolution of CITOF at all time points would be, would be awesome. Um, as you're suggesting, or as Eric brought up, you know, being able to, to use pathology to to look at the tissue architecture more deeply. Yeah, I, if I could comment on that, I mean, I you know, I agree very much with the you know the sentiment behind what you're saying. Um, I think the challenge is if we want to get longitudinal information um, about a very high number of parameters because we're a little bit limited in terms of what we can use to give us some sort of contrast. And I know you've mentioned Raman and there are things in um, you know, MR that can be pulled out and a range of different signals. But the challenge, at least for my mind, with those signals is relating them back to the sort of molecular understanding of you know, what they actually reflect. And I certainly have a, you know, have a hard time doing that. Um, in terms of you know, potentially you know, uh, a route around that and something that you know, we think about doing, which is why you know, I focused on FFPE material is you know, if you can go and you know, measure you know, uh, you know, as many things as possible, at least in well annotated you know, cohorts, you can then at least you know, discover hopefully you know, new things that seem to correlate with behaviors that you care about and try to you know, then you know, go a little bit more specifically. So I think that is a way of, you know, um, potentially hypothesis discovery, we end up probably back in the problem of, you know, overfitting that, you know, transcriptomics, you know, fell into about, you know, 15 years ago. But um, that's you know, one of the things that at least I personally think about in terms of um, discovering new stuff that wasn't on our horizon previously. Well, given Janelia's expertise and investment in probe development, the whole uh, set of fluorochromes, the, the, the work with halo tags and, and rhodamine that I talked about yesterday, as I pointed out, if you go to lifetime imaging, which newer instruments are beginning to include as a routine parameter, you can take what normally would be a single channel in the 2P imaging and expand it to three to five channels and so as long as you're not worried about going too deep, so you start all the way in the blue and go all the way to the red, you're talking about going from say four parameters at the molecular and cellular level and standard fluorescence up to 20 uh, plus parameters. And even for the extracellular matrix, um, Richard Hines has developed a whole series of nanobodies that bind to the matrix and even to specialized uh, variants that occur in the tumor microenvironment those penetrate incredibly well uh, and could be added in so that you could visualize a cellular material at the same time as you're doing the cellular tracking and even see if that's changing over the imaging time. So I just think there are uh, ways of, of going beyond what we're all used to doing in the lab, combining new instrumentation and uh, smart use of uh, a kind of smart uh, pooling approach, if you will, to really measure a lot more at the same time 
in any of these models. Yeah, I think perhaps a little bit more unbiased approach because when we genetically label cells, we're um, mostly looking at the cells of our interest. I've been thinking, can you do live H and E in the sense that the labeling itself is non-specific, but you can extract the cell, cell type information after looking at the images. For example, I wonder if one can use like a pen membrane labeling dye that will label all plasma membrane. And then um, Luke Levis here also has made this endomembrane dye that allows you to, or to see organelles like mitochondria, ER, and just watch them over time. In this case, you know you're labeling all membranes in all endomembranes, and perhaps you can then extract a pattern similar to what Eric did with H&Es, but then you have this time course um, of the tumor and its RAM over time. You only could do that if you had mixed populations with and without label, because once you have everything labeled at the membrane level, you get just an enormous amount of photons that become one mass. Uh, it's, not possible. it's not possible to discriminate individual objects at that point. I think one thing that uh, I've you know, considered but haven't tried is, you know, basically taking, I guess, the cell painting approach for looking at subcellular structures and devising a, a suitable panel that could be applied to tissue. And you know, as you're saying, Ron, that you know, if you could do this using a, you know, a microscope that used lifetime contrast as well, you could have you know 15 or whatever things in there, and that might give you, you know, enough. You know, sort of mixtures that you could um, then work out what you were were looking at, and if that could be done in a, a vital way, um, I think there could be some some progress to be made there. I I don't know if that's kind of what you're getting at anyway. Well, the two different issues. One is just increasing the number of um, parameters you can measure discreetly because they have different detection capacities, and then we actually have a different approach that enables us to do a, a kind of smart pooling of probes so that you use a few probes to look at a much larger number of um, deconvolutable targets. So again, going to higher plex with a, a fixed number of fluorochromes. So I, I just think there are some, some strategies to really move multiplex up in the, in the 2P space and that's separate from applying these also in, in the tissue space where now you can get up to incredibly high numbers of parameters. All right, go ahead, go, go ahead, Doris. You know, I was just thinking on the, the, uh, the concept of, you know, just labeling cells and, you know, as was pointed out, we need a way to discriminate uh, the tumor cells from the other cells, but that seems uh, like something that could be feasible in, in some tumors where there's differences in the composition of the membrane that, uh, for the, that are unique to the tumor cells or, or enriched in the tumor cells. Um, so I think that's a really interesting uh, concept and um, way to look at, at, at structure potentially. Maybe I'll just take the conversation of uh, getting more information, but um, uh, in a different way, which is through quantitation. So this is picking up a little bit what Eric started talking about, but I may change the question around a little bit from static information to quantitative information over time. So what we just saw in these talks were these you know, beautiful movies and we've seen them throughout uh, the workshop of cells migrating uh, into tumors. Um, there's a tremendous amount of dynamic information. Kate also showed that that dynamism, if you like, even changes over time. Um, and then Eric also showed some really interesting agent-based modeling, which is effectively, you know, dynamics of how cells reorganize within a tumor. So my question is, uh, are there thoughts on, on just getting much better quantitation of the dynamics of uh, what cells are doing in tumors quantitatively from these movies than we're getting right now? And if we get that quantitative information on dynamics, um, you know, could that information be used to even then generate like 
agent-based models of, uh, of, of cell behavior and tumor uh, and cell organization within tumors. So the theme is quantitation, but the theme is 4D now. So I was wondering if uh, people would like to comment on that. Yeah, I guess I can just say, I think there's a lot of really interesting like low hanging fruit in that regard in the stamp model. And so, you know, just looking at cell velocities, cell directionality, um, you know, uh, proximity of T cells to dendritic cells and things like that is, I think, fascinating and computationally, you know, not impossible, but um, uh, difficult to sort of make sense of. And then of course, as we're incorporating, you know, more elaborate fluorescent probes as, and you know, more channels as we were just discussing, if now we're imaging vessels and collagen and all of that, um, you know, what do you actually do with those observations and how do you make them quantifiable in a way that you can compare across treatments? Well, Ron, if you go back to what Eric presented, as well as a lot of data that are already in the literature, one of the problems with 2P imaging and doing the quantifications of cell motility and migration is there's lots of black space, everything you didn't make fluorescent. And you can have cells that wind up hitting a vessel when they're uh, undergoing chemo attraction to a point source, and they won't go to that source. They just keep running up and down along the vessel or uh, some stromal component. And if you include them in your quantification, you wind up with a big error because really all the cells are being attracted to that point source, but they just can't make it there. So unless you visualize the black space, you really will be um, in error in a large amount of what you try to quantitate from the 2P imaging. And that's part of the reason for increasing the parameter space to avoid the black, the black space and these physical impediments to movement. For example, T cells move in an amoeboid manner uh, and sort of swim around in, in an inflamed dermis. If they get into the epidermis, trying to squeeze through cadherin attachments between epidermal cells is extremely difficult and they have to squeeze in their velocity changes tremendously. But if you didn't know if you were in the dermis or the epidermis, you'd have no idea why they behave differently. So I think you can collect the data in the 2P imaging and lots of people have done that, but a lot of the data are flawed by not understanding the effect of the overall environment on that behavior. I think that's a, that's a really good point because yes, we do, we are looking at a lot of black in, in our images. And, and just thinking about, um, you know, looking at the, the vasculature. So for convenience, cost effectiveness, uh, um, we use high molecular weight fluorescent dextrans uh, typically to uh, look at vasculature. But, you know, if you're, uh, you know, trying to look at, at, at really fine vasculature um, that, you know, where you, you may not have a huge amount of signal uh, from your, your dextrans, you know, that, you know, that, that gets lost as, as well, even though you're conceivably, you know, labeling for vasculature and, and it, it becomes quite apparent when you do something like uh, take um, uh, red blood cells, uh, harvest red blood cells from a mouse, fluorescently label them and then intro introduce those uh, intravenously into the mouse that you're imaging. Um, and in that scenario, you, you can see a wealth more of the vasculature. Um, it's almost dizzying. Um, uh, but, you know, it, it's more, that's a lot more challenging, time consuming uh, to do. So, so yeah, the, the toolkits to fill in the black space uh, for these uh, structures, uh, I agree. Massive fluorescent toolkits. Just a, a very techie point, because I can see we're running out of time, but actually just doing innovative things with the frame rate would help a lot because some cells move very fast and other cells move much more slowly. And actually there's smart stuff you can do there that is a low hanging fruit that would help capture cell migration events of different cell types accurately without drowning in terabytes or petabytes. Okay, I think um, we are right on time. Um, we thank all the speakers for their excellent talks and the panelists for, for providing their um, great inputs. 
Um, I'll hand it back to um, Janine. Wonderful. Thanks to Jen and Ron uh, and all the speakers for that session. It was uh, really great. Um, and now we will um, we will take a seven minute break and resume at two ten. So we'll see you guys then. All right, I think we will go ahead and get started with the last session of the workshop. And so it is my pleasure to introduce Harold Varmas from Whale Cornell Medicine, um, who is the session chair and discussion leader. So Harold, over to you. Okay. Thank you, Janine. Um, so we are starting last session, number 17, my lucky number. Uh, heterogeneity, in fact, the title of this session is in fact the core issue of this symposium. Um, even the cancer cells themselves, not just the elements of the, of the tumor microenvironment, are heterogeneous genetically, epigenetically, and phenotypically. Uh, this session will reveal the way in which technology determines the pace of progress. It's also going to illustrate an underlying tension between discovery science, which begins by describing the heterogeneity, what elements are heterogeneous, how they influence um, other components of the microenvironment, and, and between that so-called discovery science and, and hypothesis-driven science, which aims to understand and ultimately exploit uh, heterogeneity to, uh, to, to help patients uh, uh, survive um, the, this dread disease. Uh, we're gonna begin the session with a talk by Greg Hannon, who's at the University of Cambridge and also the director of a CRUK Grand Challenges Program to understand the heterogene heterogeneous nature of breast cancer. Greg? Oops. Hey, Harold. Um, okay. I'm going to try to share my screen here. Let's see if we can manage this. So, yes. Can you see that? Yep. Uh, you've got to present. Yeah, there you go. Okay. You see the screen? Yep. Uh -huh. All right. I'm going to turn my video off to conserve bandwidth for the talk, but I'll come back after I've finished. Uh, okay. Yeah, so, so I'm in, <laughs> placed in the heterogeneity and, and technology session, and I thought what I might do um, is, is maybe take a little bit of a technological perspective and focus on some challenges um, that we've faced over the past few years um, and, and just sort of talk about, you know, what we've learned from forays into attempts at spatial multi-omics. Um, this all started about four years ago when I recruited a team of collaborators, um, a couple of whom seem to be on this call, um, to form a, a team to address one of the Cancer Research UK grand challenges, specifically to understand the 3D context um, of tumors, to understand the different neighborhoods in a tumor um, and how they determine um, the course that that disease will take. And the, the path that we took was to try to start with kind of large scale 3D imaging um, and then put detailed molecular annotation um, to those images on, single cell, uh, on a single cell level with the idea that we could both analyze those statistically, um, but then we also had the goal of presenting these in a virtual reality framework um, so that multiple people could interact with and explore um, the data that we generated simultaneously. So I'm just going to kind of walk through just a couple of the different strategies that we use to do this. Um, this is the actual VR framework that we've built, um, and that is one of the, the molecularly annotated models that you're looking at. So, so how did we get there? Um, so we need to start by getting, um, I didn't seem to be able to advance slides. Oh, there we go. Um, we need to start by getting kind of large scale um, 3D frameworks. And we do this um, using a serial two-photon block face imaging technology um, called serial two-photon tomography. And this has two distinct advantages. One is that it can look at quite large pieces of tissue. In fact, over a couple of days, you can image an entire mouse organ um, with subcellular resolution and collect fluorescence in multiple channels and also um, some other label-free uh, signals. But you know, for us, there were two really important things. One um, is that this not only generates an image, but it generates physical sections, which can be automatically collected, which we can use for downstream molecular annotation. And the second, I think, is we learned the hard way, and I, I came into this somewhat naively, um, 
in order to really get information, we need to be able to take these rather large um, pieces of tissue and focus on quite small regions of interest. And you know, effectively, the STPT is really good at finding needles in a haystack. Um, the, the sort of downsides of this are it's expensive. This is about a million pounds for this microscope. Um, it's about the size of a Volkswagen minivan. Um, and so you need pretty extensive infrastructure. Um, also, some tissues work really well on this, you know, sort of right out of the box. Um, the sort of brain and, and tumors, an example of that. But getting the picture of normal mammary gland uh, that's on the right here, the, where you can see ductal structures, took us about three years of playing with embedding conditions. But we can now take a whole mammary gland where we example, for, for example, engineer cells by introductory injection of viruses or introductory injection of tumor cells and find individual cells within a duct of the gland for further analysis. So, so we use this kind of as our principal imaging modality so that we can find regions that we're interested in. And then we take those re regions into um, sort of, uh, you know, multiplexed uh, proteome and transcriptome analyses. Now, we've used a number of different methods for doing spatial proteomics. Um, imaging mass cytometry is one of our workhorses, although we're increasingly using cyclic immunofluorescence methods, which I imagine Peter might talk about um, a couple of talks from now, including um, HiFi, which was developed by Joanna Joyce, who's a member of our Grand Challenge Consortium. What I'm showing you here on the left is actually a uh, an, an STPT three dimension, or sorry, an imaging mass cytometry three dimensional image of a breast biopsy, where you can actually visualize the tumor cells leaving the duct. And so this is a segmented image with about 40 markers underlying um, the information that, that can be presented in each cell. Again, you know, the advantages of this is commercial instrument works really well. Um, the 3D uh, part of this takes some specialized equipment. This was produced in Baron Bodenmiller's lab. Um, using two uh, individual imaging of two micron sections, which were then uh, reassembled into 3D. But over the last year, um, the Grand Challenge team working with Baron um, has convinced the instrument to do raster scanning serial ab ablation. So we can essentially take a thick piece of tissue, put it on there, and just burn layer by layer away and, and, and generate a three dimensional image in that way. Again, this is an expensive instrument, three quarters of a million to a million pounds. Number of markers is, is limited to about 40 practically. Um, acquisition speed limits the, the, the amount of information that, that you can gather. And, and just to give you an idea of why we need um, you know, an imaging modality that points us to regions of interest, I'm just giving you a comparison um, between the amount of information we can collect in one day on the STPT versus the IMC. And so we really need ways, ways to zoom in. So we've done a, a number of 3D tumor models. We focus on breast cancer um, up, of up to 2 million cells integrating STPT in about 38 to 40 parameters uh, of, of protein expression uh, and, and present those in the virtual reality framework. Now we've, we're working on linking this to spatial transcriptomics. We've tried a number of methods. Um, XSeq is the only one that we haven't imported into Cambridge. Um, but now we, we routinely use Murfish as our workhorse. Um, it's developed by uh, Xiaowei Zhuang, who is a member of our, our Grand Challenge team. And again, this is a technology that worked beautifully when we tried it initially on tissue culture cells, but was a nightmare when we tried to transfer it to um, the, the much more difficult uh, situation where we were trying to image um, transcriptomics spatially in a, in, in a breast cancer model. It took us about two and a half or three years to get there to the point where we can now routinely measure several hundred transcripts um, in, in our transplanted either Syngenate or PDX models. Um, we haven't yet linked up transcriptomics and proteomics. We're, separately, we're, we're still separately measuring those, um, but that's a real goal for the, the coming year or two. And again, you know, thinking about um, tumor heterogeneity, it's something which is a keen interest of ours. Um, and now that we can map proteomes and transcriptomes spatially, um, what we'd like to do is not only examine the heterogeneity of the cells in the microenvironment, um, which we can tell apart by their expression characteristics, but also look at the, sp the spatial heterogeneity um, of the clonal architecture of the tumor. We haven't quite done this yet, but we've got a few different methods that we're piloting to try it. Last year, Xiao Wei's lab showed that she could use Murfish not only to read RNA signals, um, but also DNA. And since all of our models are characterized at the single cell level by single cell RNA-seq, 
and by single cell whole genome sequencing, we can use um, clone specific copy number aberrations um, to, to identify clones in situ, as long as we can read copy number um, in that context. We're also testing inference based methods. Um, again, based on the single cell sequencing, we can correlate changes in gene expression with changes in copy number. And then using RNA measurements, which we now routinely make by Murfish, um, we should be able to determine um, the clonal architecture and space of a tumor. And then finally, in, in contexts where we can actually ma manipulate the models, uh, where we can engineer them, say transplantable either syngenetic or PDX models, we've been experimenting with protein barcoding, multi uh, combinatorial protein barcoding, which can be read out on the IMC. And what I'm showing you here, just to make the point that there is spatial clonal heterogeneity, um, this is a, a, a 41 transplanted tumor um, in a syngenetic mouse where we've labeled two different subclonal populations with different fluorophores. And this is just images collected from the STPT looping there. Um, and what you can see is that the clone that we labeled green and the clone that we labeled red show very different architectures um, and distributions. Um, so what have we learned and, and, and where do I think we need to go? Well, I mean, I have to say four years ago, I came into this quite naively thinking I'd be able to, to make measurements on centimeter sized pieces of tissue um, for all of these parameters. And that's clearly not true. So we need real improvements in speed of acquisition and the number of markers we can make. And really we want the ability to co-measure, for example, protein expression and RNA expression in a single sample. Um, we've learned that pretty much every tissue type and every sample type and every tissue preparation presents unique challenges. I think there's a huge issue with democratization. I tried to make the point that each one of these kinds of protocols not only requires extremely expensive in instrumentation, but, but literally in most cases, years of investment um, in bringing the expertise um, you know, in, in, into, into your group. So it's not something that you can just sort of play out of the box. I know this is a 4D um, symposium. So the time dimension is a real challenge for us. Um, in models, we've been thinking about this by serial sampling, but there are other ways um, that we can approach this. Obviously intravital imaging, but we have to follow that to the end point at which we have to harvest and, and, and take the tissue and analyze it in a destructive way. Um, we can use non-invasive methods. The, the, uh, the movie on the right is just an image. Uh, it's a photoacoustic image of an implanted breast PDX. Uh, made by Sarah Bondiak um, in our institute, and we're finding ways to realign those those, um, those photoacoustic images, which can be taken non-invasively over time, at least up to the end point um, where we where we harvest the the tumor and and analyze it by the, the by the spatial methods that I've been described. And of course, it would be good to have imaging markers that can work across multiple of these modalities. So the bottom line is we, we have a lot of challenges. Um, how do we approach this data quantitatively? We can look at the arrangement of cells, but unlike development where you can, you know, sort of replay it over, you know, um, stereotypically over multiple embryos, we, tumors don't all develop in the same way. So we have a coordinate um, reference frame problem. Gathering all the data at all the scales we want to isn't possible. And we need new innovations for making these multimodal measurements in human samples. And I think the real point I wanna make is that although we have these, um, these, these um, technologies in our toolbox, I think actually to make this something that can be deployed on scale, we're gonna need a fundamentally different approach to making all these measurements. And I'll just end by leaving up the slide of the, the different people in the consortium and um, acknowledging Dario Brisson, who's the head of our Cambridge Grand Challenge Lab. Sorry, Harold, I went a little bit over. That's fine, Greg. Um, so, uh, Greg, as we collect some questions here, um, can you say a little bit about the advantages of starting with what you acknowledge was a very difficult tissue, breast cancers, as opposed to some other cancer that might have been simpler to approach? And at the same time, can you say something about uh, the, the, the extent to which you are analyzing non-tumor cell, cells in, in, in these uh, samples, because you seem to be emphasizing the clonal architecture, what I take to be the, the cancer cells as opposed to cells in the, in, in the extracellular environment. Oh, so, so, so let, me, let me work backwards in those two. So, so first of all, the, the easiest thing is to actually analyze the cells of the tumor microenvironment. 
because you know those will have distinct expression patterns. And so that's what we've mainly done so far. So all of the data that we've collected is using well-known markers for you know, different cell types of the microenvironment. Where I think we need to go is to layer on top of that an understanding of the spatial clonal architecture with respect to the tumor cells, because we at least have early indications that different clones within the tumor are programming their microenvironment very differently. And so we need to be able to associate those two things and to discriminate the different clones within the tumor is somewhat more challenging because the expression differences that we can use to do that um, are, are, are not as pronounced. Um, why didn't we start with a, another tumor type? Well, we had um, some logic in choosing breast, right? So part of it was the interests of the, the members of our team. Um, you know, breast cancer has um, fairly well-defined heterogeneity um, with associated um, differences in outcome. Um, so it, it, it was really a, a, a biological curiosity driven choice. It just turned out to be a very difficult one, particularly for the spatial transcriptomics. The tumors are very dense. The cells have you know, very small cytoplasm, at least in the models that we've been working with. I just wonder whether you would have learned other things and perhaps more quickly by choosing a simpler type. But it, yeah, it, be, that, that, me, that may have been the case, but you know, give, hindsight is always 2020. Yeah, let me give the floor to, to the people in, who've uh, uh, entered questions in the Q and A. Um, so, uh, Chinzia Esposito asks, uh, which computational tools are employed in the image analysis to distinguish between immune desert excluded and inflamed? Uh, I think that's probably a question for the previous speaker. Maybe right? you're right. Well, yes, I think you're right. Um, uh, okay. Um, uh, Prabh Sengupta asks, uh, is curious about how you use spatial proteomics and transcriptional form information to frame and answer questions to get me mechanistic insights. Spatial yeah, so, meta meta or are spatial metabolomics the next challenge? Uh, so I should mention that we've, that we've just, um, so there's another grand challenge team called Rosetta headed by Jay-Z Bunch. Mm -hmm. And we've, we've just started to look at this sort of spatial um, mass spec imaging approaches. And in fact, um, we now know that we can take at least one kind of mass, mass spec imaging, DESI, which is a non-destructive um, imaging modality. And we can read out RNA actually after we do the mass spec imaging. So we can draw another line between two modalities, although we haven't joined them all up yet. I imagine we'll be able to do protein on that um, you know, reasonably easily as well. Um, you know, in terms of, of how we ask questions, I think you know, some of the early things that people in the team have looked at, these are studies led by one of our team members, Raza Ali, you know, is to correlate sort of cellular neighborhoods, right? How often are, um, you know, different types of cells together, um, you know, as opposed to what you would expect by chance in the frequency in the tissue. And, and what he finds is, that, you know, there are certain TME structures that correlate with outcome and the different integrative subtypes of breast cancer. And this was done in Baron Bodenmiller's lab in collaboration with Carlos Caldas, also two team members. Um, the different integrative subtypes seem to shape their microenvironments in different ways. And what's interesting is if we take PDXs derived from those subtypes and look at nothing but the serial two photon imaging in let's say GFP and SG mass, the structures of the microenvironments that are formed are, are wildly different. Okay, I see we're running over time. I don't want Janine to have a stroke. So we're going to <laughs> move on to the next speaker. Um, thank you very much. Um, and hope you you obviously stay around for the Q&A afterwards. Um, so now we're going to turn to Nellie Poliak from uh, Dana-Farber Can Harvard Cancer Center, uh, who will uh, further explore tumor heterogeneity for us. Okay, Nellie. thank you. And uh, let me start sharing my screen. Uh, hopefully you see it. Um, so I, these are my disclosures and um, I'd just like to give you a 10 minute overview of what other assays and the technologies and the questions we have been trying to answer in intratumor heterogeneity. One is to use various technologies to look at the clinical samples and look at clinical relevance of intratumor heterogeneity. We're also trying to understand the functional relevance of all this heterogeneity we see and then uh, how we could actually modify it and how we can follow the evolution of the tumors and what will the future will be. So I think I, we don't have to um, emphasize to this audience 
that tumors are very heterogeneous so of this heterogeneity, like the genetic, epigenetic, microenvironmental, and the transcriptomic heterogeneity all present in a tumor and not just in the cancer cells, but in um, other cells as well. Um, so we became interested in intratumor heterogeneity many years ago, and we started uh, studying the phenotypic and genetic heterogeneity by a technology immunofish, where you can do combine immunofluorescence with uh, fish, fish for probes. And uh, what we saw, and then we converting this to these digitized images, and you know these very pretty pictures show you that there is a very significant spatial heterogeneity of the within a tumor. And also this is changing during treatment. So these are neoadjuvant chemotherapy samples before and after treatment. And just by the colors, you see the significant changes both in the genetically distinct populations. These are two different examples of two different tumors and also the phenotypically different population, even just based on looking at these uh, few markers. And this was very significantly associated with response to treatment, such as patients who had the lowest uh, pretreatment heterogeneity responded best to treatment. And now this has been seen in many other cancer types. And there was just a large paper in Nature on looking at all the, you know, I don't even know how many thousand tumors. And really, this subclonal genetic heterogeneity is really extensive in uh, most human tumors, and it's associated with poor outcome. Then we developed another technology where we could actually look at point mutations uh, in tumors in addition to copy number variation, we call it starfish. And this again, an example like how nicely you can see the genetically distinct cancer cells and then draw these topologic maps of the uh, distribution of these genetically distinct cancer cells. And again, you see the extensive spatial heterogeneity and changes over time during treatment and interestingly here in this particular study also, we found that it's, it's not just the um, number of cancer cells that we see, meaning like the diversity that is predicting outcome, but what's important, how this diversity, spatial diversity changes over time. Like in this example, that was the very predictive of survival, uh, even long-term survival in patients. Now, this was the, just highlighted by Greg. This paper just came out in, um, in bioarchives where they actually went even very extensively. You can, they did look at um, whole genome sequencing and combine it with spatial transcriptomics. So now you can get a really detailed view of the distribution of genetically distinct uh, clones using similar uh, uh, padlock probes that we also used for our, our initial study. So you really can get a large extensive view of the heterogeneity. Then of course, uh, we also wanna look at the protein level because uh, that's what's important for many times for targeted therapy, such as for HER2 targeted therapy using the antibody against HER2. And this is an example from our recent study on cyclic immune fluorescence, which I think Peter Serger will talk about in much more detail. But basically, within HER2 positive tumors, we see uh, cells that are HER2 negative. They completely lacking the HER2, like this is the white probe here. And then these are lacking HER2, as you can see. And not surprisingly, uh, these patients don't respond well to HER2 targeted therapy because they're lacking the target. So it's uh, really important for particularly when we're using targeted therapy to assess the heterogeneity for the target within a, a tumors. And it's not just the expression and genetic alterations that are heterogeneous in tumors, but more recently, we have been looking at the response of the cells to various stress like hypoxia or you know, nutrient deprivation and so on. And even though in exposing the same cells to the same um, stimuli, such as hypoxia, this shows a hypoxic uh, responsive GFP in the cells and mCherry to visualize the cells, you see that actually not all the cells turning on um, uh, you know, HIF signaling, even though they all exposed to the environment. And what is the reason underlying this, you know, lack of response, uh, which is kind of assessing more the functional heterogeneity of the tumor cells. So one of the noise could be coming from transcriptional heterogeneity, which um, many of the epigenetic enzymes could be regulating this uh, cell to cell 
heterogeneity in transcription, such as KDM5 years ago, and see that the uh, cancer cells, particularly the ones that are resistant to treatment, like here the full estrogen resistant uh, cancer cells, are have a very extensive cell to cell transcriptomic heterogeneity. And um, this KDM5 inhibition could actually decrease this heterogeneity, which could uh, also explain why they sensitize um, tumors to, to response to endocrine therapies. But of course, it's not just the heterogeneity of the cancer cells that determines response, um, but the stroma, the microenvironment. And in this HER2 um, study that we recently uh, completed, um, in a xenograft models of um, HER2 positive breast cancer, we actually found that the most significant determinant of response to treatment is the stromal microenvironment and particular cell types that are changing in response to treatment are more significantly associated with response than uh, what we see in the cancer cells as well. So that again highlights the uh, importance of the microenvironment. And the microenvironment is also a very important determinant of resistance to treatment. For example, in these 3D co-cultures of brain metastatic stroma with HER2 positive breast cancer cells, the red color indicates the lack of response when we co-culturing the cells with a stroma. And as you see, many of the uh, HER2 targeting agents, these cancer cells are resistant if they are together with a stroma. You see the shift in a IC50. So in order to study this, we actually developed a reporter used on, um, based on this synthetic notch, where you can get different color cells depending on the interacting or non-interacting with a stroma, or you could design it for any kind of cancer cell interactions. And I just show you a movie here that you can very nicely follow over time. You see the red and green and then turns into purple. That means that those cancer cells interact with the stroma cells and they upregulate this synthetic um, notch uh, reporter. So this just really shows how, um, you know, this again, heterogeneity due to the stromal interaction is very dynamic and it contributes to therapeutic resistance. And the uh, microenvironment and not just the local, but the systemic microenvironment is very important for tumor heterogeneity and drivers of clones. We showed this in the uh, xenograft model and also for driving polyclonal metastasis. We found that there is a systemic changes occur in the, in the, in the in, um, individual with a polyclonal tumor and uh, that includes changing of the microenvironment and also changing in the immune uh, environment systemically that contributes to uh, metastasis. And basically what I like to point out here that the polyclonal tumors have a different phenotype, unique phenotype that's not seen by any of the uh, clones individually, suggesting that the mixture together is, is behaving differently than each of the individual parts. And of course, we also want to track um, uh, cells over time during therapeutic resistance. Like in this particular study, we have been using barcoding, as many others have used barcoding to follow the clones over time. And there are technologies now developed to look at in vivo um, clonal tracking like the confetti mouse. This paper by Ellen um, Belmain's group has shown how you can look at over time with a uh, tumor development. And then very recently, Jonathan Weissman published a really nice paper with using this CRISPR uh, Cre technology that they can track the clones over time and actually build a, really at the single cell level, build a um, architecture of the tumors. And ideally, we would like to do this in patients and liquid biopsy is one of the tools that um, are trying to assess this. So what is the future, uh, what we would like to achieve? So ideally, we would like to assess intratumor heterogeneity of the whole tumor and in vivo, if we can, because biopsies very frequently can underestimate or miss areas of the tumor. And uh, both in experimental models and also in patients and molecular imaging or you know, liquid biopsy could be potentially a way to go. And then I also like to highlight the functional heterogeneity because um, that seems to be a determinant of you know, what we really care in terms of response to treatment. And that would be uh, ideally would like to nice to see this, uh, particularly in patients in a 
response to treatment because we don't want to continue with a therapy that is not effective. It would be good to uh, determine this. And then lastly, it would be not able to predict tumor evolution and response to treatment based on assessing the tumors with all these very complex technologies at many different levels and then build a mathematical model and basically run like in silico clinical trials. Like for example, you would have a patient tumor. We tried to do this uh, uh, in in our, one of our past studies, and then look at this heterogeneity. You know the properties of the cells that compose this tumor. And then in a computer basically model, how would this tumor grow? How would the perturbation by the treatment potentially change this? And then based on this, um, um, try to have a better, uh, more rationally designed combination therapy for that particular tumor of the patient because we very soon with all the combinations that we're trying to do, it's just gonna be impossible to run as many clinical trials and we have to be more uh, better with choosing the right uh, combination for the right patient at the right time. And I think I just barely went over time and I just like to acknowledge all the uh, people who, who did the work in, in my lab, so. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you, thank, thank you. you. Um, I won't make the mistake of, of feeding you uh, questions that are still residual in the Q&A, uh, but uh, let me, while questions are accumulating, let me ask you one thing. You mentioned that uh, you, you asserted that, that the heterogeneity of the microenvironment was in a sense predictive of, of therapeutic response. Mm -hmm. How do you know it's not the other way around? Um. What, what do you mean other way around? Yeah. The, 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 the response modifies the environment? The therapeutic agent may be influencing the yes. constituents of the microenvironment. Yeah, I mean, uh, that's, uh, you know, we of course don't know because uh, I think that you can dissect, uh, separate these things. It's all, all interactive. And the other thing, what I like to, you know, emphasize that there is almost no such an oncogene, I'm, I'm sorry to say, that there are not really a cell autonomous oncogene, because even like RAS or, you know, mutant P53, they also have an effect on the neighboring cells and in the environment. So uh, I think that's something we need to, you know, um, you know, there are many papers now showing that, but um, everything the cell does and changes, of course, influences the microenvironment. Okay, well, with the uh, ubiquitous Prabhs uh, Sengupta has yet another question. Uh, yeah. With so much heterogeneity in cell characteristics within the tumor, how do we define what is a cancer cell and what is a non-cancer cell in a tumor niche? I would think we could have, we can, you can answer that. Uh, guessing there is a continuum of parameter states across different cells. I think we could do a better job set, uh, the, distinguishing tumor cells from non-tumor cells mm -hmm. based on genotype. Um, but should we treat them as a community of cells, not worry about cancer or non-cancer cells and try to devise strategies to counter yeah. them from a community level, interfere with communications? I think this is the perturbation yes. question facing us again. Yeah, I mean, I, I totally agree. And there are, you know, initiatives around this line that you have to treat the tumor as a whole, because as I highlighted the mixture of cancer cells behave differently than each one individually. And particularly the non-cell autonomous drivers and non-cell autonomous interactions are really important maintaining heterogeneity. And if you go back in the 1980s, uh, um, uh, Gloria, um, they published papers on calling cancer cell communities. So uh, you have to uh, look up back that literature that was pre-internet. <laughs> Uh, there's a question here from Manuel uh, Valiente. Uh, is a blood test going to be going to resolve key aspects of the tumor um, or just what is more abundant? Do we know enough about the biology of how the tumor sends information to the blood? So this is uh, of course, uh, querying your assertion about uh, liquid yeah. bodies. Well, I think you can uh, vision this blood test two ways. One of them that you're measuring something that's directly coming from the tumor. Um, the other is that uh, I mentioned that the tumor ha has systemic effects. So you can actually look at that effect that the tumor has indirectly on the tumor bearing host. So for example, people have seen that the, even the leukocyte signature is different in somebody with a particular cancer type, but I think there is a, so much going on in that area with the liquid biopsy and showing that even the fragment sizes are different from different tumor, but 
I think we don't know yet whether oral uh, cancers have. Fair, fair warning that yeah. the liquid biopsies are not going to be necessarily a totally reliable way to assess the con constituent no. of the tumor itself. That's no, fair. and breast cancers particularly not very uh, accessible, not so really giving a signal. In the more general discussion in just a moment, mm -hmm. uh, about trying to stay, be a more reliable timekeeper and not uh, offend uh, the timekeeper in the sky, namely Janine. Uh, I'm going to move on to our third speaker, uh, Peter Sorger, who is uh, uh, at uh, Harvard University um, and uh, is going to talk about uh, on this, continue the discussion of the same topic, but with uh, a pharmacological perspective as well. Peter? Harold, thank you very much. It's really you know great pleasure to be at this pretty exciting workshop and thank you for putting this session together. Um, I have a couple of relationships which do uh, impact some of the instruments that I'll talk about, um, but shouldn't, shouldn't lead me astray, I think. Uh, I'm gonna return to some of what we heard about, uh, I think earlier today, um, from Eric uh, about the sort of in, the role that tissue imaging can play both in research and diagnosis and to call out um, the sort of extraordinary efforts of anatomic pathologists over, over a century uh, to develop the primary method that we use both to stage uh, cancers today and also to manage their treatment. And I think as we all know, that's based almost entirely on uh, analysis, usually just through an inexpensive optical microscope, a transmitted light microscope of H and E type specimens. And for any single tumor, the estimate is that the AGCC staging now has on the order of uh, 100,000 publications that's determined the staging criteria. So we're really interested in trying to work out um, what the, these underlying molecular programs are and how we could then build the science of tumor progression around this kind of histological understanding. And so to make that possible, uh, we've been looking at a, at a range of samples, more specimens than we should, because that's what we get uh, funded to do. We're not one of those wealthy European uh, universities like uh, Greg's. Um, and the, one of the methods is this uh, hyplex immunofluorescence. We typically collect four to five channels at a time. And we'll talk about it in detail, uh, but I'll show you data deriving from it. Uh, we do a lot of... Uh, clinical grade H and E because we want to relate after all to what is known about these specimens, uh, spatially resolved RNA sequencing. Much of what we do is FFPE, so we can't use conventional RNA-seq methods. We have to use something slightly different. And then there's sort of a data integration and analytical component. So I think one of the things that will be appreciated in all of this is the extraordinarily uh, large multiple scales. And you've got some of that from Greg Hannon. Uh, you know, here's just an example of a primary um, melanoma for which we're building an NCI tumor atlas. Uh, we're now trying to find the areas of, of uh, tumor invasion. So the, the so-called melanoma in situ, right where it's up against uh, the immune cells. And you can see in the first set of slides, sort of a low resolution view. And here we're just using a deconvolution 3D microscopy. So nothing really fancy compared to what's available at Genalia to actually get direct access to the places where the immune cells are in contact um, in this case with the tumor cells. And you're gonna see uh, the tumor cell red, SOX10 is gonna to switch to white in just a second. You'll see it making immediate contact um, with uh, TIM3, LAG3 positive, so potentially exhausted T cell there with contralateral sorting of both of those markers, which we take to be uh, an indication of activity. Um, so that's what's sort of possible. And in the last couple of months, um, we started to build fairly large scale data sets. And I'm gonna tell you about why that's important in the moment. Here's a colorectal cancer data set that we're actually sharing with 10 other research labs across the country and sort of a technology project. Our own effort has been to do, um, to do a 25 section reconstruction. Uh, so not isotropic the way you saw with Greg's, but with thin section. Uh, and then we do whole tissue imaging. So two centimeters on a side and we get out of the somewhere, somewhere around five times 10 to the seventh to 10 to the eighth cells. Now, one of the things we immediately asked of that uh, kind of data is how big are things? I mean, sort of a simple question. So let's just look at how big are things when we define them by a single marker. And in these images, we have uh, 30 markers. The shortest length scale that we found, and this is done by spatial correlation, is for endothelial cells, CD31 positive. The longest length scale, around a millimeter or so, was for B cells, which are CD20 positive. And if you go into the image, you're seeing a sort of a picture in the middle and you're seeing a spatial map of two square centimeters of tissue on each side. 
Of course, the B cells correspond to tertiary lymphoid structures, which you find throughout the stroma. And um, the endothelial cells are just small vascular uh, vasculature, which is particularly rich uh, in this colorectal cancer in the muscle. So we actually already gained from this very simple kind of spatial statistic, uh, something uh, sort of informative with respect to the tissue. But the really sort of, I think, unexpected observation that we came up with uh, in the last couple of months now is let's take the big specimen and imagine we were only going to look at a little piece of it. And that's done in a research setting, either using methods that Greg talked about, like imaging mass cytometry that look at little pieces around a couple square millimeters, or here we're going to be looking at tissue microarrays, which many of you may have encountered or widely used in translational settings because you can put up to 200 samples or so on a slide. So the total number of keratin positive cells, those are either tumor or normal, we're not distinguishing here, is 46% uh, in this specimen. Machines help us find that out. If we go in However, look at virtual TMAs, you're going to see the scatter you see in this red plot here. We get an estimate all the way from 1% to 95%. There are 3,000 cells in each TMA on average. Go and choose 3,000 cells on average, and you're going to get this distribution shown here, the much narrower distribution, either in red, blue, or green. And so what's the reason for this? And that is that when we talk about power analysis in an image, we have to talk about the central limit theorem under spatial correlation. When structures are correlated, we have to look at enough cells on average that we're three to four times bigger than the size of what we're looking at. And that seems intuitively obvious. And in fact, you can quantitatively explain all of what I've shown you here um, um, with respect to this underlying theory. And we have a paper in BioArchive if anyone's interested. So this leads me then to say, what matters when imaging tissues for molecular features, right? One of them is plex. We've heard about that in genomicists just keep on going higher plex, mRNA gives us that. Resolution is important. I didn't show it to you, with, uh, but with structured illumination microscopes, we can easily take archival specimens and go down to 100 nanometers. The size of the specimen, this issue of spatial power is absolutely critical. You cannot infer anything accurate about the distribution of uh, the tumor microenvironment without looking at a good fraction of it. And the tumor I'm showing you here, I haven't had have time to tell you, has three completely distinct invasive regions into the underlying stroma. And then the issue of time, and in humans, for us, that's mean uh, pre, on, and post therapy. We have one patient just coming out in Nature, um, in, in nature um, um, Medicine, excuse me, which has actually 30 serial biopsies from one unfortunate patient. And then there are places where you can do direct intervention on accessible tissue. Um, there have been some questions about how to do this. We seem to only publish our papers on bioarchive these days, but if you search for them, this is our little project garden hose, not as ambitious as fire hose at the road, but an attempt to build an automated pipeline for this. <laughs> so how are we gonna actually make this sort of data shareable in any way? So I've just told you, we're gonna need whole tissue images. They're gonna be a couple of square centimeters. They're gonna have 10 to the seventh cells in them. And the current practice in pathology, as I think we're aware, is for an attending to sit next to her students here and actually physically manipulate a slide. And so we've recently built open source software. It's called Minerva. Which, which are built around the concept of a Maria museum guide, actually. We think of them as digital docents. If you were clicking around on the little, the sort of a movie of somebody clicking around, you can just get those for yourself, even on your cell phone. It will not only allow you to do a Google map, sort of move around these big images, but it'll also allow you to be guided to things that we think were important. So it looks a bit like an interpretive figure. And I think that's gonna make this kind of information accessible. Histopathology, as you know, is really using the same technology that it did uh, over a hundred years ago. Now, how do we actually figure out what histologists use for this? So uh, one way, and this again, riffs off what Eric was talking about, is um, we've actually taken tissues. Um, we had a set of training sets from our histopathologists. We then build them out. It's a fairly simple machine learning process. We actually can then predict. So we find the same thing, and then we can map it back onto the tissue. Here's a piece of that colorectal cancer. There's a bit of adjacent normal. There's some solid grade three tumor glandular and mucinous. And the big surprise when we've done this now on several tumor types is how extraordinary heterogeneous morphology is. And that's now mapped here by the degree of red. That's actually how intermixed the machine learning phenotypes are. And uh, what we've learned then is pathologists are amazing at going out and finding the archetype, the sort of diagnostic archetype in a sea of heterogeneity and using that for tumor staging. And working out what that is in molecular space 
um, is the current challenge. And the one thing I can say is when you get these graded phenotypes, what we often see is gradient. So we're very used to in tumors, because we get a lot of sequencing data, we think about dichotomous difference, but that's not what we see in imaging. We see continuous difference. And here's sort of a set of three different clinical grades all in one small part of the specimen. And they correlate quite nicely. We don't think this is, this is um, a regulatory relationship, but they correlate very nicely with gradients of molecular features. And the spatial scales here are not only the ones I told you about, but they're the same spatial scales as you see in tissue development, which I think was alluded to earlier in this talk. So in this sense, we've got spatial distribution across tumors on all these different scales, similar to what we see in developing tissues. So as I wrap it up, let me just say what we think is gonna be necessary to move forward on this are new types of human machine interfaces with active learning. So we can extract from the, the sort of experts in the field, but also make this quantitative. And here's just a, a little tool that we've built. It has a lensing feature, not only allows you to sort of magnify areas, but I think more consequentially allows you to see, as you can sort of see associated with that lens, heterogeneous data, it could be molecular or genetic, and it allows humans and machines to efficiently interact. And then you can collect the things you like on the right and ask of a database, hey, do you see anything similar anywhere else? So these human machine interfaces, we think are gonna be as important as instruments and reagents. They're gonna go from exploratory uh, to hypothesis testing. They're gonna be new collaboration machine interfaces. I showed you one example of that. And then sort of conclusions of this talk, sort of opportunities, expertise in pathology, I think is a hugely underutilized resource. 90% of all diagnosis and cancers made by pathologists, 10% or less actually based on genetics. Um, there's a lot of basic research there too. Don't bet against fluorescence microscopy. So there's a lot of converting microscopes into mass, uh, uh, mass cytometers. Um, there's a lot of mileage still in fluorescence microscopes. Um, there's gonna be competing requirements. And I think we heard about this from Ron as well between multiplicity resolution and spatial power. Um, and we think those are gonna be solved by integrating imaging with AI uh, and machine learning. And so we've been incredibly lucky uh, to have a team co-led by pathologist Sandro Sanagata, all started out of a single postdocs project and to build an international group of people trying to advance this kind of multi-faceted um, multi aspect of tissue imaging. Thank you. Okay, Peter, thank you very much. Uh, we have about three minutes or four for questions. Um, I, I see the HTAN logo and uh, wonder uh, to what extent is the, has the traditional pathology community bought into this? And are you getting uh, people um, uh, uh, interested in trying to change the way in which staging is done and prognosis, prognoses and therapeutic uh, suggestions are made? How, how are you trying to organize the pathology community to make better use of these resources? It's a fantastic question, Harold. This is actually the, key, the core to our team. Those are all pathologists, including my own father. Unfortunately, pathology expertise is not hereditary. Um, so we've organized them. These, these individuals are largely excluded from the HTAN effort. The HTAN effort hitherto has been overwhelmingly single cell RNA sequencing with very little microscopy in it. Um, we'll see how that evolves over time. It's up for program review actually in the next couple of months. Um, my own experience has been, as we reach out to this community, this is a local community, but internationally pathologists are extremely interested to be engaged. They've not been the beneficiaries of a lot of technology. Um, and the last thing is from Genalia point of view, we need to push public domain tools because they're getting large companies trying to force proprietary software down their throats. And that I, that I think is gonna be a problem. But I think huge interest from the pathology community, we need to proactively engage them. Questions from the, uh, the audience. Don't have much in the Q&A or the chat box at the moment. Um, Peter, this is Ron, the other Ron, not the Ron V. Oh, was, yes, hello. Ron G. Was, hey, Ron G. <laughs> that, was, that was terrific. One question is that you know we keep hearing about all these different competing tools for getting multiplex images. As you pointed out, there are now a whole bunch of companies moving into that space with really very expensive uh, instruments and proprietary reagents, which limits what you can look at. So how do you see that moving forward? Yeah, it's a good question. Uh, the methods that we've built are all copy lefted. We actually explicitly copy lefted them. We survived a lawsuit from General Electric 
uh, that claimed that it owned the technology for looking at nuclei actually in a fluorescence microscope of tissues. Um, so I, you know, I think they're gonna be parallel public domain and commercial efforts. I think the commercial efforts are gonna be, my own view is most important when we get to translation, uh, particularly in clinical trial space where you, know, you are going to need things to ISO 14, uh, 13485, you know, you're gonna need um, a 510K certified device. So I think that's where companies are. I think incisive imaging, you, you, you need a microscope, you need some antibodies from cell signaling technologies, and you need three chemicals that you buy from Sigma. So we're strongly emphasizing technology, you know, demo democratic technologies, and, I, and we have no expensive instruments. Okay, I see there's a question from Eric Sahai about uh, ensuring reproducibility with machine learning. I'm afraid we have to defer that to the general discussion because we're running about 10 minutes behind time, and I, I don't want to further offend uh, Janine. So um, thank you, Harold. Thank you very much. Uh, now let's turn to uh, to our final talk of the session before we have our general discussion. Uh, and that uh, that talk is going to be going to be given um, by uh, Michelle Baird, Baird, who's at the National Heart, Lung and Blood Institute at NIH in the Waterman Lab. Michelle, we're off, welcome. And so you've got your screen being shared already. That's great. Yeah, no, thank you very much for inviting me to, to share my work with you guys during this really exciting workshop. I hope you, everyone can see everything okay. It looks yep. good. Okay. So as many of the speakers have highlighted um, throughout this workshop and today in the session, uh, tumors are heterogeneous at many levels. And now that we have so much single cell sequencing data and, and various other tools, uh, we know that there's very distinct cancer subtypes, both within patient to patient, and then also within the same patient from tumor to tumor. Uh, so in my case, I study melanoma, and as using that as an example, approximately 82% of metastases are genetically distinct from the primary tumor. And that's something that I'm really interested in. And so how this sort of genetic heterogeneity develops you know, after metastasis from a primary tumor site. So as cancer metastasizes, one of the most interesting things is thinking about how they have to migrate through this really dense ECM jungle gem um, away from the primary tumor site to eventually a blood vessel or a lymph node to metastasize. Uh, like in this example right here, this intervital movie of a cell migrating along a, a linear collagen strand. Uh, so one of the things that I really think about with this is how do they actually deform their nucleus? So as the stiffest and largest organelle in the cell, it must be really actively deformed in order for the cells to metastasize through these really tight areas. So I traditionally think of the nucleus as this you know, robust fortress that protects our genome from insult. Uh, but over the past few years, people have really found both in vitro and in vivo uh, that the nuclei actually are not so protected, that as cells are migrating through these confined environments, they experience these transient losses of nuclear envelope integrity. And that's shown here in this movie above with a fluorescent protein that's tagged to an NLS signal that as there's a small little local rupture in the envelope, uh, this NLS signal goes into the cytosol of the cell indicating a small transient rupture. And these are not just all tiny ruptures either. They can be large scale herniations of the you know, chromatin and the histones shown here below. And so what is the consequence of this sort of blebbing of the nucleus into the cytosol of the cell. Well, the cytosol of our cell has a whole bunch of DNases that are there to naturally protect us from, you know, RNA viruses and DNA viruses and things like that. Um, and actually, when the nucleus is burst open like that, the DNases can attack the nucleus and cause DNA damage. And due to defects in DNA repair that are, are well known in cancer cells. Uh, this has been shown in vitro to lead to heterogeneous long-term uh, heritable genetic uh, deformations in the cancer cells. So this really led to our initial question, uh, which was during metastatic progression, our expression levels of nuclear envelope genes actually altered uh, in patient populations. And this could facilitate nuclear deformability, uh, maybe easing migration through tight areas, but also as a consequence leading to this loss of nuclear envelope integrity and potentially DNA damage down the road. 
So to do this, we're looking at a wide range of model systems. So in this case, it's an example of our 3D model systems where we're looking at tumor spheroids embedded in a dense collagen matrix. And you can see as this melanoma cell is migrating away from the spheroid, that there is that transient loss of nuclear envelope integrity leading to a spillage of this NLS signal. And then also there's a brief little green foci, hopefully you can see it. Uh, and that's our DNA sensor C gas. So so that is a sensor that's normally in the cytosol of the cell, and then it will rapidly assemble to any sort of double-strand DNA that's exposed outside of the envelope. And we're using that as a general marker to know whether this is a, a rupture that could have some genetic consequence down the road. So we're also doing this in a melanoma tumor model in mice, and again, we're seeing the same sort of foci. Um, especially at the periphery of the tumor, uh, indicating that these tumor cells are having a, a rupture event. So to get a more mechanistic understanding of this, we're using a PDMS confinement device that will confine the cells to a physiological range. And one of the things that we discovered was benign cells in general, in this case, it's a melanocyte, they don't seem to be perturbed by this degree of confinement. Whereas pretty much every cancer type that we've looked at uh, immediately experience a catastrophic rupture at this three micron confinement height. And this again is shown by spillage of that NLS signal and then localization of that bright sea gas foci. So we next wanted to determine if we could isolate any particular proteins of interest from patient populations. Uh, so we used two publicly available uh, geo data sets from RNA-seq from metastatic melanoma patients. These are all treatment naive BRAF B600E tumors. And then I'll, we also used a, a series of melanoma cell lines uh, to then find around 300 genes that were involved in nuclear envelope structure and function that seemed to all be consistently upregulated in our more advanced melanoma cells. So we now, since we know that they're all upregulated in cancer, wanted to use just a basic screen approach. So we did an siRNA knockdown screen to try to isolate which one of these genes would maybe be promoting this fragility that we see in melanoma. So interestingly, we found that lambda B receptor seems to be specifically promoting this behavior, this fragility in our cancer cells, because when we knock it down below, while we do still see a rupture of a small scale, we're not seeing that giant giant chromatin herniation as indicated by this green sea gas foci. So now that we know that downregulating LBR is sufficient for cancer cells, we wanted to upregulate it in a benign cell. So again, we're using melanocytes and we found that upregulation alone uh, was sufficient to induce an increase in fragility similar to what we see in our cancer cells. So that's just right here. Normally they have around a 25% rupture rate and then it goes up to around 50% similar to what we see in the cancer cells. Uh, we next wanted to then look at the deformability of the cells, uh, wondering if maybe as a possible positive for the cancer cells to have this upregulation of LBR could be a mechanical change, could be an ease in allowing them to migrate through tight areas. So we're using a 25 micron bead attached to a cantilever tip. And we see that in general, cancer cells have a quite soft nuclei. It's very easily deformable. And this is something that we don't see in our benign cells. And interestingly, overexpression of LBR alone is sufficient to actually soften the nuclei and make them more deformable as well. So LBR in general is an inner nuclear membrane protein uh, it has a lamin and a heterochromatin binding domain here, which is the Tudor domain. Uh, it also can bind to HP1 and directly transcriptionally silence chromatin. It also has an eight transmembrane cell reductase domain. So this is responsible for locally synthesizing cholesterol in the nuclear membrane. So in data, I unfortunately don't have time to show you today. Uh, we found that the lamin and the heterochromin binding specifically of the Tudor domain is what's conferring this fragility response in our cancer cells. Whereas the sterile reductase domain seems to be conferring the actual change in 
the mechanics and the deformability of the cancer cells. So just to give you a little cartoon of how we're sort of conceptualizing this, uh, we think that clusters of LBR in malignant melanoma are actually also clustering stiff heterochromatin, stiff lamins, and this is leading to a local area of almost defect in the membrane between these two really stiff structures. And when the cell is faced with an insult, such as confinement, uh, this can lead to a blubbing locally of that membrane area that would lead to DNA exposure to the cytosol and then in stuff that we're doing right now and exploring uh, potential DNA damage and genetic heterogeneity down the road. So just to sort of address with my last few minutes um, how Janelia could, could help in this work and, and other people's work looking at genetic heterogeneity, I used a wide range of models for this project, everything from RNA-seq to, to two-photon animal imaging, and every model really has its place to address a specific question. And while it would be lovely to do everything in the animal and get that heterogene heterogeneity of the tumor microenvironment, really it's just not possible to address as many questions as you have in that sort of system. And I really see Janelia as having a lovely uh, impact in the area sort of in between the two model systems. So I'm echoing a lot of what Andy Ewald said yesterday in his really beautiful talk where he described really the, the need for thoughtfully engineered in vitro model systems that can somewhat bridge the gap between a single cell and a cover slip or even a group of cells in a spheroid and like an animal model or something that would be maybe into the patient or the clinic population. So two areas that I think Janelia specifically could help is really in developing you know, a better in vitro model system system that could replicate tumor heterogeneity, both in cell type and resource gradients and ECM composition, but also have the resources and tools to do the advanced microscopy that you would need in order to image those sort of model systems, which are awesome, awesome, but, you know, also quite tall and hard to image due to being embedded in sort of a, a dense light scattering matrix. Um, and then the questions that you could address with that would be sort of longitudinal questions, like how cellular heterogeneity evolves over time, how does it respond to selective pressures, things like that. I selfishly would like to learn more about how DNA damage is repaired over a long term and what population of cells that are damaged go on to metastasize later down the road. Um, additionally, Janelia is so strong in tool development, it would be really great to get some new specific functional heterogeneity biosensors that are heritable from cell to cell. For example, I'd be interested in some sort of DNA damage construct that would permanently mark a cell and its lineage for anyone that had a DNA damage event. And then we could really answer those questions of how many of these cells metastasize after a DNA damage event from the primary tumor or during metastasis or later on down the road. So with that, I really like to thank the lab for supporting me through my project and for Claire Waterman for being such you know, a wonderful mentor and allowing me to, to go off on this, this project that's a little bit different for us in our group. And I look forward to your guys' questions. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, while we're waiting for questions to assemble or get asked, uh, let me ask you, um, I, I can understand how the phenomena you're describing can generate uh, genetic heterogeneity by as a result of DNA damage and, and variation in, in repair in different cells. But how uniform is the, the, the depletion of, uh, of, of the LBR? And, uh, and do you know what accounts for the re reduction in LBR levels in these cells? So we definitely don't know what particularly accounts for the increase in the cancer cells. Um, looking at the patient RNA-seq data that we have, it does really nicely correlate with the staging of the melanoma. So benign nevi, it's still relatively low. And then if you look at stage one and two, it's starting to increase. And then stage three and up, you see a really sharp increase in, in LBR. Uh, so normally, if you think of something like a neutrophil, uh, they normally have an upregulation of LBR and a downregulation of lamin A. And a lot of cells before they're differentiated also tend to have that track. So I'm interested in maybe thinking these cells are reverting back to an earlier developmental state where that would take over. Okay, we have a couple of uh, mechanistic questions. Uh, 
Uh, Nellie Polyak wants to know whether uh, the chromatin landscape is affected by, uh, by nuclear softness and does this increase epigenetic heterogeneity? That, that's a great question and something I would be very interested in, in pursuing further. We don't know specifically in this example right now. Uh, one of the markers that LBR particularly binds to, uh, we're looking at now and we do see changes in distribution of that heterochromatin marker with LBR. So I think there is evidence to support that that would change potentially epigenetic stuff as well. Well, you may want to chat with her by email later <laughs> on. Uh, Ron Vale uh, asked whether the in vitro confinement and nuclear compression result in chromosome breaks. I would guess yes from some of the movies. Uh, from some of the movies, it does look like there's almost a, a trailing chromosome from a catastrophic break. Um, in some of the staining I've done with like a gamma H2X marker, it looks like the vast majority of cells after the confinement have more localized breaks as opposed to a large scale those chromosome. Breaks, I'm sorry, do those breaks occur at so-called fragile sites? That we don't know. This is all through, through gamma H2X. We don't have the resolution to, to look at that yet. Uh, and then um, uh, Mika Mikala, Mikala uh, asked whether uh, LBR plays a role in neutrophil extra chromosomal trap formation. So a person in our group right now is looking at it for um, nets as well, since it has such a such a role in the morphology of the nucleus. A lot of the, the earlier known phenotypes with LBR are related primarily to neutrophils, where if you get rid of it in neutrophils, as opposed to having this lobulated nucleus, it becomes quite spherical. So it is interesting to think of the interplay between that and the mechanics of the neutrophil nucleus and how that could lead to changes in net formation. Do you know whether down regulation of LBR is occurring at a transcriptional or translational or protein degradation level? So it looks like at the RNA-seq level, we know transcriptionally it's going up in cancer cells. And then by Western blot, we know that the protein level seems to be going up. Uh, but I also don't have a, a really nice cell matched control to our melanoma line to say for sure that's, that's happening. I can only say in benign cells, it's lower and in cancer cells, it's higher. Okay. And uh, someone's asking, Mike, uh, Mike, I don't know who Mike is. Uh, is this nuclear compression a dominant source of CCAP? Of CCAP? Uh, I haven't thought about that. That's a good question. I, I would have to look into that. <laughs> OK, well, you got something back. <laughs> <laughs> OK, I think we're going to call it uh, I'll call a halt to it here. And I'm supposed to be joined. Uh, thank you, Michelle, very much. You stay, you stay online. Um, and uh, you'll be joined by our other speakers, Greg, Peter, uh, Nelly, are we coordinating them? Can you give them big images? Yeah, there we go. They're coming. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Everyone's face should be equally sized here. Um, just to kick things off a bit, um, let's go back to a question that Eric Sahai raised earlier on about reproducibility of machine learning. This is a question that Peter, who raise the issue, I want to address first. Uh, and uh, obviously reproducibility will be key in clinical decision-making. So is, it, is heterogeneity simply too, um, too far advanced for us to be able to, to, to uh, um, view with any certainty that machine learning is going to teach us what we need to know since sample selection, um, you know, even, even the big samples that uh, are being used by Greg and uh, others um, are maybe small with respect to the entire amount of tumor burden. And uh, how do we know that when we're using these new methods for classification of cancers and, and uh, allocation of patients to certain groups with different prognoses and different likelihoods of response to various therapies are gonna be benefited by this analysis. Peter, what do you think? Yeah, let me just say, you know, it's a it's a fantastic question. The issue of reproducibility is one of them. Uh, you know, machines, machine learning algorithms. I think people are all aware of this. You have a worry about overtraining them that they memorize a particular data set and doesn't don't move to another data set. Um, there are methods for dealing with that. I think one thing that would be hugely helpful are repositories of public images. 
So almost no microscope images are actually publicly shareable. So I showed some images today, it's about five terabytes of data. We can give that to anyone at Amazon, but um, it's worth noting that the NIH and NCI have definitively concluded that image data will not have a national resource. Um, I think we're gonna do a lot better off working with Greg in Europe where there are gonna be these national resources. So one thing is to make the data more shareable. I think the second aspect of this is interpretable. AI. Um, and much of our work on machine learning has actually been funded by DARPA and other settings. And they're extremely concerned about the interpretability of AI. And that's because they just don't think that life critical decisions, treat or don't treat a patient, surgery or not surgery, are going to be adequately addressed by black boxes. So that's the other way is to have, have, have machine learning applications that actually tell you something of scientific value or medical value. Um, and, and and I think that's that's related to I think what Eric mentioned, but but not the same. Yeah, I see that uh, that Matt Vanderheide wants to weigh in here and defend at least one American uh, institution um, who that has done some some apparently reputable work on imaging data and radiographic scans. So Matt, you want to save us from this uh, Europe Europe. Your Eurocentric view that Peter seems to espouse. Uh, I, I mean, I mean, I mean. I was just going to say where this has worked because this is not me, but this is other people at MIT have, you know, my my colleagues have done a lot of work on this, looking at mostly like mammography data and other kinds of radiographic data, and where that's been looked at, what they've actually found is that if you take and ask like I know a hundred pathologists to read a mammogram, you get like huge variation in how they're actually read. And the machine learning algorithm was actually able to collapse those calls into a much more definitive thing, which you know can be the dif difference between biopsy or not biopsy. And so I think where there's some power in sort of the machine learning algorithms to apply to things like image analysis, it actually can be quite powerful because, you know, look, if you're at Sloan Kettering and you have the world's greatest breast pathologist, they can, you know, read this out, but, you know, trying to spread that across, you know, thousands of different pathologists around the world, you know, people have different opinions, see different things. And I think some of those pattern recognition abilities of the machine learning actually has the potential to make things better or more reproducible as opposed to not, although all the issues Peter brought up about overtraining and stuff certainly although, apply. Very that. quickly, just a rejoinder, to 100% agree with Matt. The, the work here is of Regina Barzilai, I think you're referring exactly, to. Exactly, that's exactly what I'm referring to, yeah. But what's really interesting in Regina's work is inner observer agreement in pathologists for breast cancer diagnosis is almost 90% in a clinical trial and about 60% in a diagnostic setting. And the reason for that, I think Matt hit on, is it's just a lot of work. So this was the augmentation that Eric talked about, is to augment what we do now with machines, neither replace, but make, and why is it better in a trial? Because the pathologist has more time. So I think inter-observer agreement can be high, but in a high pressure diagnostic setting, you're absolutely right, man. Now you want to weigh in on, on uh, the, the uh, function of uh, Figshare and Mendeley and Oh yeah, that one is just some journals are trying to promote to deposit the uh, image data, you know, the raw microscopy images. And I mean, you know, we, we happy to share the issue has been the size and how to transfer because, you know, as, uh, you know, Peter mentioned, some of these you can transfer in cloud, but it's not easy to, you know, each one of our, because we, we also doing like whole microscopy scans, each image is like a couple of gigabytes. So um, we need a really like a system to deposit those. And I, I wish the NCI would have similar to what we have for GEO. For GEO, we have the, you know, like the, or the genomic data, but we don't have anything like that for image data. And I, I do think it should be useful. Yeah, well, I can't speak for the NCI anymore, but I can ask, oh, I'm Greg. Yeah, yeah no, no, no. I, I just want to echo that. I mean, I think the, the issue is that imaging data has the potential to totally swamp, um, yeah. you know, what we were used to dealing with, with genomic data, right? I mean, you generate hundreds of terabytes of data, you know, over a course of months, right? And there isn't a good repository for this, and it's absolutely essential you know, in terms of independent reproducibility, that people have access to this. 
And just to pick up the, on the point that you know Peter made, I, I don't think that I don't think that that Europe would be accused of running rich universities. Certainly, I haven't been the recipient of that, um, <laughs> having experienced both systems. Um, you we know, just had to razz you, Greg. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, but but I but I think you know this point this point about you know giving people access to data, you know, for the purpose of creating more efficient processing algorithms, predictive algorithms. You know, but also putting the tools in people's hands. I mean, I think this is really difficult in the spatial space. Um, you know, because there are things that you can do with a basic microscope. You know, protein detection, cyclic Im immunofluorescence uh, is probably the most easily democratized of the methods. Um, when you go to spatial transcriptomics, you know, the quality of the microscopes that you need is different. And then it just, you know, sort of scales from there. And I, I think, you know, if I were to challenge Genalia to think about something, you know, I would, you know, challenge them in the instrumentation space to come up with a method that lets somebody have a box on their bench top to generate this kind of data. And, you know, just, again, I, I came into this field completely from the outside and completely naive but it has been a, a, you know, a really shocking experience in terms of you know, what you have to invest to even get very basic information at this scale. Uh, and, I, and I think that is a real issue. Well, since this is a big issue in, in, the, in this uh, workshop in general, that virtually everything we talked about uh, involves uh, very complex primary data, are there ways to try to reduce the, the size of the depth of the data even in the imaging domain by developing some kind of code that allows uh, information to be stored in, in a more concise way. I'm, I'm uh, an IT naive, but, uh, but yeah. whether it's the, the meta metabolic domain or, or uh, genomics or, or transcriptomes, um, are there ways to, to, to develop some mm -hmm. kind of way to categorize data so that at least, so while the primary data can be stored in one place that the, but what gets exchanged uh, is uh, in a kind of shorthand that is useful for diagnostics and for uh, therapeutic mm -hmm. choice. Yeah, I mean, you know, like once we extract the image data, that's easily shareable. So we have this, what I was showing, for example, and Peter also had these digitized images. So, so that you can share and you, you can have the same spatial information and for each cell, you would have the, you know, transcriptome and, uh, you know, copy number, mutation and all that. So that, that is shareable. So that is much easier and um, much smaller files. So, but that's already I want to say how quickly that uh, Jason Swedlow has- Yeah, I was, I was about to- Yeah, I was going to say- He's, 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 he's weighed in Jason, in defense Yeah, of Jason, Jason, speak is, up. Is it, yeah, is it possible to unmute him? Uh, I, well, I, I can tell I, you what- I, I mean, think Janine can do that, can't yeah, you? Yeah, give me a second, okay? Yeah. I think what Jason wanted to bring to our attention when he gets unmuted yeah. is the European Imaging Data Resource Run. Yeah, yeah. It is. yeah, that's right. But I also want to mention that, you know, the commercial cloud has hugely democratized data sharing. So I actually think there's, I actually think this is, is possible. I don't think it's unsolvable. So if I want to give Michelle all the data I just showed you, which I do because there was a lot of melanoma in there, which had a <laughs> bunch of misregulation of nuclear envelope proteins. All I need to do is I would appreciate it. Yeah, all I need to do is give you an S3 index and you can clone it in the cloud, right? And the you now bear the cost of of storing that data. So so I actually think there are solutions to this. And yeah, but Pete, it's not Europe. about it's not about you giving it to Michelle. It's about somebody seeing your bioarchive paper and saying, Oh, I, I, I would like to pick that up. Because you know, at some point you'll be overwhelmed with doesn't the, matter, Greg. The level of interest. Request or pay S3 cloning is completely public. All you need is an S, it is Amazon. Eat, oh, okay. All the big clouds have it. All you need is an account, which you can even get for free, although it can't go very far for free. And you can clone the repository I showed you without permission from me. So okay. I'm just pointing out that there are things out there and the, the push here is democratization, which is I think what you're saying, not yeah, that there's completely. central control, but that anyone who wants it can have it. Sorry, uh, Jason, Jason can say now, much more Jason, about this. Jason is now visible. He needs to unmute. There he goes. 
Okay, Jason, and then I want to follow um, up. emphatically agree, I think, with everything that's been said. So Peter's correct. There's lot, first of all, there's lots of ways to do this. Um, posting data in an S3 bucket and then sharing those codes, that's certainly one way. Building um, interactive applications and APIs, et cetera, is, is the approach that we've taken, and that's in the image data resource. Um, papers are published, and that's a thing that's sitting at about 260 terabytes now. That's running at um, EBI. I apologize, it's European, um, but um, it is a global resource. We're publishing data from groups and from um, the United States and countries all over the world. Um, to emphasize, I think what Peter what Peter was saying, and also the general point is routinely publishing all data sets associated with all publications gets us into a scale that we don't have a solution for. EBI is trying to build something they call the bioimage archive, which will start to do that. But that's a huge, that's a huge effort. Um, and finally, the last thing I think, um, I think uh, Cornelius said is, you know, slinging terabytes of data across, you know, um, uh, networks is actually quite challenging. And so we need our data formats that allow streaming, a la, you know, the same way you think of working with Netflix or YouTube, and that's also something that we're working on. So there's not going to be a single solution. There's going to be multiple parts to this, but um, you know, there definitely is work. Um, there's just progress being made. Although Eric Sahai has a comment in which he emphasizes the need to have the reduction methods uh, be common, and so that everybody can use them. I don't know if you want to comment further on that, Eric. No, I think that's fine. Okay. I think one thing, Harold, that you know, for maybe is relevant to Genalia though, is, is you know, uh, you know, I joked about Project uh, Firehose and Garden Hose, but you know, the Broad and the Genome Centers played a huge role in making genomic data there, and I think accessible, and we owe them all a great debt. And you know, between something like Genalia or Allen Cell Institute, I mean, there is a capacity for publicly focused private enterprises to actually really move the needle. And in Britain, that has been uh, the welcome trust, actually, that's what's built out some of that. So so I think Genalia could play a significant role here without somehow taking on the whole problem. Yeah. Ron, do you want to comment on that? My point was actually to go back to um, Greg's presentation. Actually, I was thinking about Ron Vale oh, as, right. as the Genelia uh, chief engineer. Yeah. But I, you know, if you want to comment on it, that's fine. But oh, no, good. Ron V, go ahead. Sorry. <laughs> I'll just say, just say Ron. I'm digesting the conversation. <laughs> okay, Ron. Ron G, you want Sorry, to continue? Said, and then pass it on to Ron. <laughs> yeah, so so I, it's a slight shift in the subject, but it wasn't clear, Greg, what your throughput was in doing your um, block face two photon plus uh, post section uh, analysis. Yeah, yeah. So, so we could do you know, a mouse organ the size of a lung or a brain in, you know, four or five days, full optical, physical. Um, the 3D models that you saw from IMC took several weeks on an instrument. So it, it, it is, it, it, I mean, it's elephants and rabbits, it really is. Um, so, you know, to do, you know, to go from, for example, a, an organ in mouse, um, where you have a model and, and you want to find an, uh, an, an area of interest in a slide, a couple, three days. Um, you want to scan that region of interest three by three millimeters, let's say. Um, you can do that in a day. You want to do that in 3D. That's a totally different ball game. And then you're dedicating two, three weeks of instrument time. Yeah, I just wanted to raise that since I figured it was somewhere in that order of magnitude. No, 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 I, it's, it's, a, it's a really important point, which is why I think that in order to make this workable and to democratize it, you know, make this accessible to everybody, you know, these technologies are great, but I suspect that what we're gonna see in three, four, five years is gonna be based on a completely different principle. Greg, I was wondering if I could ask you this is in our case, we find that we can generally acquire the data a lot faster than we can process or understand it. Um, yeah. So, so 
although data acquisition has been the focus here, I actually think, you know, coming back to maybe some of what Eric mentioned, this kind of machine assisted data interpretation is pretty important. So we store a lot of our data now in oak barrels, we say, where it goes to age until we get around to having the time and energy yeah. to look at it. I mean, I, I, didn't, I didn't think we have that problem, you know, with sort of large three-dimensional data sets. I, I do think we have that problem with two-dimensional data sets. And, and I think that does raise the issue of, you know, how you actually analyze these quantitatively. You know, the things that have been done so far often look at sort of cell type relationships, you know, that sort of thing. Anything more complicated often needs a human to stare at many of these, formulate a question, and then go look at that question quantitatively. So, you know, I, th I think you're right in a sense that we can be overwhelmed with data collected in a certain context, right? Um, but, you know, the really big kind of let, let's look holistically at a, even a very small piece of a tumor. Um, that takes a good long time to collect. And we still, I think, don't have a good idea of how we create a reference framework for comparing sample A to sample B. And I think that's a real challenge. Ron, did I answer your question? Part of it. The second part had to do with combining the uh, RNA data and the protein data. Yeah. So have you tried to put the whole thing into a matrix using oligo-labeled antibodies instead of uh, fluorescence? Yeah, we, we, we've what done that we... in a limited way. Um, and I think eventually that is going to work. Uh, we've been spending a lot of time working on the um, chemistries to rebridge antibodies with oligonucleotides so that we preserve their structure. Um, you know, when we stick oligos on antibodies, we have problems with nonspecific binding, which probably just has to do with the charge of the nucleic acid. We look at things like LNAs. So I, I think we will eventually get to that sort of co, that co-measurement um, situation. We're not quite there yet easily. So, I mean, you know, if we, if we read 100 antibodies in 2,000 genes, I think we would learn an awful lot from each sample. You know, one thing I noticed um, in your talk uh, uh, also that I was just wondering if this is something that, you know, that Ron Vale was thinking about too, is there's a lot of multi-scale here and you show things on high scale and lower scales. You know, we've done some of that more modestly. Um, you know, high resolution sections and the lower resolution setting. And it actually calls for a different type of microscopy where one doesn't simply push, you know, sort of res ultimate resolution in which of course, Genhalia has had huge success, but, yeah, but, yeah. but actually it's sort of a kind of multimodal capacity where you can scan at low res, then you have a kind of closed feedback and then go to high res and, and, and retain a reference frame. And I, I, those microscopes have been talked about Jason probably has something on this for over a decade, but I haven't seen any of them actually happen. True closed loop control where you quickly scan and then you sort of zero in and build, let's say a three dimensional representation of part of a tissue. Definitely interesting point, Peter. I think one of the challenges is that this sort of goes back to some of the comments that you were making on the AI approaches is that they tend to be quite narrow in their application. So it's certainly you can build an application to find cells in a specific state, but then you need a different application for another state and so on. And so generalizing that has been a challenge. I think we need to wrap this session up. I see uh, Ron Vale, Ron V, uh, looking a little nervous about the time. Um, we have a, a, a private session coming after this. I want to thank everybody for their good questions and this good discussion, as well as the, the, the lively talks. Uh, clearly, we're in a phase of data acquisition, trying to understand patterns and learn from what is obviously um, a pathological and heterogeneous biological situation to move um, ourselves to the point of asking questions that are meaningful biologically and medically. Um, and I would argue we're not quite there yet, but that uh, it's clear that uh, the tools to assemble a, a picture of these heterogeneous uh, pathologies are coming online and with rapid speed. And uh, that will 
promises uh, to deliver the kinds of questions that uh, will lead to uh, important answers in the, in the, in the not too distant future. So again, thanks everybody. And um, uh, Janine, is there something that you'd like us to do at this point? Um, yeah, I think um, uh, Ron, you're going to make some, some closing comments and maybe Michaela also. Yeah, and first, Harold, do you have a, a sentence or two of? Uh, well, I, I would consider that to be the sentence. <laughs> Just enunciate. <laughs> I'm looking forward to having enough information to ask the right questions, put that way. Okay, good. Well, um, maybe in our closing remarks, uh, Michaela, do you have? Uh, sure. Yeah, no, I, I just wanted to go back to, to this workshop being part of your 40 program and, and uh, I mean, really remind us all that cancer is a 40 disease, it's a tumor progression and we have the cancer cells progress, we have the microenvironment progress. And I think this is a challenge that came up over and over in this workshop that uh, we still need to really know how to, to access this 40 progression uh, over time. Uh, I also really want to thank all the speakers. When we planned this, we were a little concerned because there were several other tumor microenvironment uh, meetings this spring. Uh, but I uh, think that this different format where we were really thinking about the questions and where we're discussing things in a different way uh, was very helpful for the field as well as hopefully for Janelia. And uh, I want to thank the speakers for putting in the effort of making these different talks. I, I know from from my own end, that it's a little harder to put such a talk together. So we really appreciate that effort. And uh, I wanna thank the audience and particularly perhaps Singh Gupta. Thank you for all the questions. <laughs> <laughs> the interaction was, uh, was really important, I think. So Ron. Great, well, I'll first of all start by uh, thanking you, Michaela. Uh, it was great to have a bona fide uh, TME person uh, as a co-organizer. Uh, Harold, uh, always fun to work with you. I'll get to Janine in a second. But uh, yeah, I do, I do wanna say um, a word of thanks to the, the speakers uh, for spending these two days with us. And um, I know we, we made a big ask and also for everyone to deliver uh, a different kind of talk and really put a lot of thinking into it. So this won't take very long, but um, uh, I just want to thank all of you. So Donita, Daniela, Matt, Sarah, Brian, Eileen, Eric, Dorothy, Kate, Shushen, Greg, Cornelia, Peter, two Michelles, uh, Manuel, Varun, uh, Adrian, Shannon, Anna, Ranji, Val, Peter, Andrew, Oscar, Joan, Ilaria, Bernardo, and Serena. It was um, it was really fun spending uh, these couple of days with you and. Um, it, it, was, uh, it was a fun venue. Um, and uh, Janine, well, I, I think from all the or organizers, we have to give uh, enormous amount of uh, thanks to you for a tremendous effort organizing this. Uh, this, um, this workshop went very smoothly and the talks were great, the discussion was good. What I, I think the audience doesn't really know is the tremendous amount of uh, background work that Janine did uh, to make this all happen. Uh, there have been numerous behind the scenes communications with the speakers and um, also, also getting the style of, of what we wanted to achieve with this workshop and the talks. So all this came about because um, of all, all of the work that Janine put into it. And, um, you know, for Michaela, Harold and I, you know, the workshop is done. Uh, but then Monday morning, uh, Janine is working on another workshop. <laughs> and so this will go on for- uh, We're not gonna retire, Rod. <laughs> no, so Janine, you're awesome. Thank you so much. You made uh, um, our work as organizers uh, uh, so easy and fun. And we got to do uh, a lot of fun stuff. And we had a ton of fun working with you, Janine. So uh, thank you very much. And maybe I'll pass it to you, Janine. Thank you. I had a ton of fun working with you guys too, especially especially you, Harold. I really um, I kept time because you really held me to it. Um, 
So I just wanted to remind everybody uh, at the very end here that, um, as Ron said, this is not the last of Janelia's 4D cellular physiology workshops. If you are interested in participating um, in future workshops, visit 4dcpjanelia.org, and I put the link in the chat box. And from there, you can see a lot of the information about our future workshops. You can sign up for updates, um, uh, not only on the workshops, but what Janelia is doing um, in the area of 40CP um, so that you can keep in touch with us. Um, I also want to mention that the talks from this workshop and all workshops um, will be available online. Um, you can access them again through that same website, 40cpgenelia.org, and uh, they should be ready in the next uh, couple of days. So, you know, check us out and come back for more. And um, thanks to everybody and the panelists. Um, we will start a closed discussion, uh, I would say, in about 10 minutes. Ron, does that sound reasonable? You're muted, but I'll, I'll, we'll go with like... Uh, Say yes, it's reasonable. Yeah. Whatever you think, Janine, that's my... <laughs> <usual>. <laughs> Cool. Yeah. Let, let's um, give everybody sort of 10 minutes to to wind down and then um, we will see you on the in the closed discussion. Thanks, everyone. Have a great weekend.